Hello, ladies and gentlemen, it's prototype number 31, a qualifying statement. That's because we have reached the point where CMBW, Cosmonarchy Brood War, the most popular, well, maybe not the most popular yet, but the, the most ambitious project ever made in StarCraft One. it's getting more popular. That's why popular was on the brain. Uh, we're getting to the point where we have enough players who are interested in competing in our tournaments that we actually need to hold qualifiers because we can't simply just allow anybody to sign up. Uh, we have exceeded our quota, you could say, and so some uh, names must be jockeying in the ring and uh, all that stuff in order to prove themselves worthy of such a feat. And, uh, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, I, I have no idea how, how busy the qualifier will end up looking, uh, but we'll talk a little bit about the format in this very episode of Prototype, and we'll also talk about a number of other things. We're going to be talking about uh, audiovisuals, readability, that's actually going to be the first topic. Uh, we're going to talk about the meta developments we've seen during Ascension 6, because there's some really interesting things there with uh, CMBW. Of course, I'll do a playoffs preview for round two. I'm actually recording this on Saturday, which means it'll go live a day after playoffs round two. Uh, so a little bit dated there uh, in, in some theory or another, uh, but... Hopefully you find the analysis interesting even in hindsight, or maybe you're one of those people who hasn't actually watched the Ascension tournaments yet, and so this, uh, this little bit of information will actually be of use to you in some way to prepare you for what's coming. Uh, and of course, we will also have a discussion of uh, not just the qualifier, but the format they're in, uh, and a little bit about what we're going to be doing in the near future, going into the next year. I also wanted to briefly cover some things that I've been thinking about regarding Pagan because I've learned some things regarding level design that, uh, well, let's just say I had never done this kind of level design before, so it was actually kind of interesting. And then, of course, we'll close with the coffee questions. So let's talk about the audiovisuals and readability of Cosmonarchy Brood War. Uh, I guess you could kind of package this together with the idea of like first impressions or first time viewers or whatever. Uh, we, we make a lot of video content for CMBW. We do a lot of replay cast overs. We do a lot of tournaments, which obviously are streamed uh, and you get the tournament VODs and people can take a look at them. And, you know, I mean, the, the background of this very prototype is actually taken from the events page. And I just added a, a little bit of a blur to make it obvious that you weren't really meant to read all the details. But it's clearly a tournament bracket. And uh, that's to, to give you this idea that, like, hey, we've had a competitive focus lately. We've got this qualifier coming up, all that stuff. Uh, but when it comes to uh, audiovisuals, when it comes to readability, when it comes to, like, the first time viewer experience or uh, player experience, indeed... I do think that there's some things that are sore spots, right? We all know that, like, there's certain Zerg units that have really bad graphics. I, it's funny, because a lot of people are complaining about the Sikralisk lately, but, like, have you guys even fucking seen the Mortothrakor, bro? Like, there's certain units that need the adjustments way more. Somehow, I guess some people, because, like, the Cascathalor has been in the game in its current state visually for, like... I don't know, like two years or something, maybe more. Uh, people are like totally fine on the Cascathalor, but I think that's another really egregious one. I think the Bactylisk is actually quite bad, but not as bad as the Sikralisk, admittedly. So yeah, there's a lot of graphics that I would love to uh, just replace, rip out of the game and and, and violently disp dispense with and replace with something better, you know? Uh, but we need to find the something better first. So uh, let's just say that the... The, the hunt for those kinds of things is a bit slow going, and the creation of those things also requires effort. So, you know, if we find something that could work better as a placeholder graphic, then you better believe we'll, we'll throw it in there. But uh, for now, we're kind of stuck with what we got, at least to my knowledge. Uh, but I haven't really done a huge amount of effort uh, on, like, new projectiles, new effects, and that sort of thing. And that's where uh, recently DF has actually started working on some projectiles for CMBW. He made a new projectile for the Sentinel, and it becomes really obvious that... Uh, well, actually, I don't think he specifically designed it for the Sentinel. I think he made it for his own purposes. But as soon as I saw it, I was like, dude, that's the Sentinel bolt. Because you just look at it. You think about that rail. You know, it's supposed to have a rail gun. Like, it looks like something that would penetrate. It looks like something that would pierce. So, of course, I would use it for that. So, anyway, uh, I think it ends up looking pretty good. Um, I suppose you could maybe theme it for a Protoss as well. Uh, but yeah, either way, it's it's pretty legit, I think. And uh, you know, I might even swap it out for orange instead of blue uh, and and try to theme more of the, like all of the, the Protoss stuff related to like blues and whites and have the uh, Terran ones be like oranges and reds and maybe yellows or something. Um, and essentially they have like lasers <clears throat> and that sort of thing. And, and maybe that would be better. Uh, but for now, like a lot of the railguns are blue. 
and uh, you know we would just sort of see how that one goes. Uh, but anyway, beyond the like color scheming and stuff, uh, the fact that it's a different visual. Like, it's a different mesh underlying it. It's a different uh, actual graphic. Visually, it, it kind of indicates its power. And I feel like that's really important. And it's something that I actually don't see... Well, I just don't see that much being used in that way, where it's like, we don't have that many custom assets for projectiles. We don't have that, that many custom assets for effects and overlays and stuff. And so there's definitely going to be some question marks as to, like, what's actually happening. Uh, a number of other times uh, that we noticed things, like... When uh, one of the matches in Ascension seven, uh, Ascension Six group stage, we had Three Crow against Dead Infested, and Three Crow mind controlled a bunch of units using Tyranny, and uh, he had this mind tyrant rush and stuff. And I could tell he was having a difficult time figuring out which units were actually under his control because it was a mirror matchup. And normally, when you're not in a mirror matchup, you just think, "Oh, the Terran units or the Zerg units are obviously, you know, mind controlled because I don't have those natively." But then you get into weird territory where it's like, "Oh, hey, this is strange. We've got uh, we, we've got like a Dracodin, and I also have Dracodins, and then." which one is mine and which one's my enemies that I stole. And then, you know, you walk the wrong one too far away and it gets stunned and given, you know, given back to your opponent. So that's a case where we clearly needed some sort of overlay to indicate, Hey, this is stolen. And that also will help visualize it for the opponent as well, because they'll see that overlay and they'll see it next to the mind tyrant or whatever. And then they'll think maybe, Oh, that's a, that's a controlled unit or like they stole that unit. They give it back. And they'll recognize that, Hey, maybe if I like don't attack my own unit, uh, you know, th then I'll be able to get it back somehow, right? And so there's all this sort of, like, intuition that uh, when you add a read, it, it gets created. A lot of the content of this particular topic, where I'm thinking about audiovisuals and thinking about readability, a lot of it comes from uh, a recent run-in with Benza, who is a, a new component of the server, you could say, a new, uh, a new joiner in the last... I don't know, two weeks maybe. Uh, he's been playing the project a lot. He's been uh, looking at it, taking some notes and stuff. And, and he uh, screenshotted a couple of things from the Ascension broadcasts and like talked with me about them uh, at later dates. And he was like, yeah, so like in this screenshot where the Calculisks are attacking, I can't really understand like who's favored and, and what's even happening with the damage and stuff. And, you know, he was bringing up the fact that like, well, at least the, the, what I t interpreted from that was, you know, it's really hard to figure out, like, well, the projectile isn't different than the, all the other Zerg projectiles, so, but the projectile, like, the attack behaves differently, so it should have a, a custom read. Uh, and, uh, you know, to this end, actually, DF is working on a Schizrecore projectile, uh, which is obviously going to uh, have that returning aspect to it, right? And then he also said he had some idea for the Atreus, which is good because it has, like, splash associated with it, right? It's a homing splash plasma projectile. So it should absolutely be something that, uh, you know, looks a little bit different than the Dracodin projectile, which I think is what it currently uses. Uh, so, you know, that's a, that's another case where it's like that the visibility, the readability, the, the way that the assets actually work, they don't necessarily communicate the whole story of, of a unit or of a weapon or of its power. And that's more or less what Benzo was getting at. And I thought it was really cool that we had somebody come in and I guess he, he's, he's got like a technical background. He's also worked a lot with Blender, mostly with organic stuff. Uh, I'm not sure about animations and, and whatnot, but uh, you know, he's, he's working with Blender by trade and, and other software like that, like Houdini and stuff. Uh, so he's definitely a guy who like is, is a great asset to have just in the, in the audience, because he will be able to identify certain things that, you know, maybe he's able to break them down in ways that we didn't, or maybe he's able to just remind us as a new ish player, um, you know, the certain experiences or whatever uh, that he's had as a new player, like, okay, what is it? What is his take? What is his position? And the fact that he's also got a technical background means that to me, I don't, I look at that and I think to myself like, okay, we are in a pretty good spot for just looking at that and, and thinking to ourselves like, Hey man, we've done a lot of, of good work on this, but there's, there's some things that still need to be done. Some things that are still a little bit botched. And like, maybe we've just come become sens desensitized to them. And like, maybe we just don't recognize them as much. And then somebody new comes in with a technical background to actually explain it in good detail and uh, has that experience and then shares us, that with us. Uh, and, and that's really good. I mean, if you don't have a technical background, but you still have like a, a flaw to point out, then we want to listen to that too. But it's especially useful if somebody can kind of like cut through the initial 
uh, I would say like floundering or ambiguity of people without a technical background who want to report an error or report something that they think is like a, a shortcoming of the project. They're able to actually say that and say like, oh, okay, yeah, well, because of this, it's not readable. Whereas like maybe the average person doesn't really know what readability is in a video game context. Like maybe they're not even familiar with the term. So that's like one example of what I'm talking about. And I feel like having Benza there, it was really cool for him to, uh, to, to share some of that and actually like just want to dedicate some time to even talking with me about it. I thought that was really cool. Uh, so, you know, we're definitely receptive to that kind of feedback. And uh, I suppose I, I can lump this in. Uh, there was a, a gentleman who joined the server uh, yesterday uh, as of the time of recording. I'm recording this on the 11th of November. So on the 10th, he joined and he was just, um, complaining about the user or the, the custom names for the units and stuff. So, you know, he, he didn't really explain why. He just said that they were cringe. And that's a case where it's like, you're clearly coming at this from a fundamentally different perspective than most other people in the server, uh, than certainly than, than myself as the, the lead designer and the person who came up with most of, well, I would say like probably 95% of the names or whatever. Uh, some of them I, I did crowdsource in a sense, but I still like selected the, the final candidates and then, you know, put them up for a poll in some cases. In some cases, the poll chose otherwise, and I still decided to go with a different angle. I think that was true for the anchor. And I feel like that was actually a good choice, uh, borne out by the fact that uh, I can't remember what even the other options were. But um, yeah, like I think everybody is, is appreciative of Anchor by this point. Uh, so anyway, <clears throat> that's like a case where we look at that. We think to ourselves like, OK, you know, somebody's coming in here with critique. But I, I, I would prefer that critique to at least like you have to put some effort into interface with the people in the project that you're critiquing. And if you just come in and say, well, these names are bad and you don't really qualify what that means. Hey, that, that, that ties into the title of this episode. Then I can't really use that feedback. It's not, it's not about like, you know, I didn't, I didn't get offended. I thought the whole thing was kind of funny to be honest, but it, it, if you take away the, uh, potential emotional response and you ignore that part, cause that's not really what this is about. It's more like, I look at that. I look at the person saying that and I think, well, how can I articulate or how can I actuate this feedback? How can I actually make it a thing? How can I turn this feedback into something that is actually useful? And we did actually have a conversation about names and stuff afterwards. Uh, we didn't decide to, to make any changes to the schemes or anything, uh, but uh, we tried to essentially perform alchemy on this low effort uh, post who, uh, you know, the, the guy ended up rage quitting the server pretty quickly after that because I think <laughs> and Oslix was... Uh, <laughs> it was sort of like making fun of him a little bit, but, uh, you know, whatever, like if you, if you're going to come in and sort of act a bit silly and, and a bit dense, then, uh, I don't know, like, what do you want the reaction to be exactly? I was about to, in the process as he rage quit, I was in the process of saying, well, I hope you enjoy the time with the project, despite your misgivings about the names. Uh, but, uh, that didn't end up getting communicated. So you know what, buddy? If you're listening to this, then you know my wish. You know my hope. My hope is that you still enjoy the project despite thinking all the names are cringe. Uh, you know, th and we did, you know, th that's the kind of thing where it's like, I want to interface with negative criticism of the project as long as it's, you know, put the bare effort, a bare minimum effort necessary to be constructive. Um, like, I don't really, if I don't know somebody, then I don't really interpret their praise or their criticism um, if you can even really call it criticism, uh, if it's just like flat out, like positive or negative descriptions or adjectives, like names are cringe or names are epic. It's like, well, I think that they're pretty epic. Usually uh, I don't think that they're cringe, but even beyond like my agreement or disagreement with the, the statement, it's not really that useful if I don't know the person, like if this person who says that they're epic also thinks that shadow flyer a unit that is actually, that's a real name for a unit that's coming out in Stormgate. Shadowflyer is an epic name. Then like, well, I can't really trust your standards on epic names, can I? <laughs> I mean, like clearly there's a, a bit of a disconnect. Maybe you just think everything is epic, you know? Sort of like how British people say everything is uh, brilliant, you know? Uh, maybe maybe that's the case, right? So like knowing a person, knowing their, I guess knowing their culture in the case of the British brilliance, um, knowing knowing a person is more important because that gives you the context for what they actually are like. And so like, that's why you, you kind of need to ingratiate yourself into a community and like really, uh, you know, share what else is your, what some of your foundational, uh, principles or, or thought processes or whatever that what's led you to believe the way that you do and then think the way that you do uh, learning about that, uh, learning those kinds of things about a person gives the, their context uh, or gives a lot of valuable context to any criticism or any praise that they might give. And that's sort of where I, I go from that. You know, I think about the situation and I think like, well, I, I try not to surround myself with yes men for the same reason. Uh, you know, Veek and I have 
had in some cases public uh, disputes about certain things about the game and the state of the game and the balance and stuff. Um, and it, but it seems like we broadly agree about certain details, and that's enough for us to collaborate on the project. And you know, like I guess another example would be like Mystery Meat uh, has voiced uh, his complaints about certain things uh, a couple of times. And you know, sometimes I agree, and sometimes maybe I think you know the, it's a skill issue. Uh, but either way, and, and this goes for every player, not just Mystery Meat. But like the 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 reaction is sometimes like we we broadly agree that like certain things are are good about an RTS and certain things are not so good about an RTS. Uh, one of the things that was funny as an example is uh, Mystery Meat mentioned that he started to play CPL recently and they play it on the uh, ASL maps, the the ladder maps or whatever, uh, and. In those maps, there's a bunch of busted ass tiles, and he never used to notice them. But now he's played on CMBW maps, which have very few, if any, busted ass tiles, because we actually take the effort to uh, go through the effort to to make the blends and add them to the tile sets and stuff. Uh, and it's a laborious process, but it results in a seamless experience, relatively speaking, like in terms of the terrain. And he's essentially, uh, in some ways, been spoiled by that because he said that he started to notice all of the busted ass tiles in, in the in the StarCraft One maps, and uh, thinks it's a pretty it's pretty goofy or whatever. Uh, so you know that's just funny because like you know in theory he's super focused on the gameplay, but he still ends up noticing that kind of stuff uh, every now and then. Uh, so you know the, the the finer things you start to appreciate when you're used to Cosmonarchy Brood War, I guess. Uh, so you know that that but that's the kind of thing that's like. Well, we we went through this effort to do it, and like we kind of broadly agree that it's probably a good good thing to do, right? Like, is, is it critical? Maybe not, but is it uh, like is it worthwhile? It does it give you uh, some kind of an improved experience? Yeah, I think it does. You know, maybe you can't really measure it too well because uh, it's just like, oh, uh, I don't notice something stupid. But I think that maybe that helps you actually get focused and stay focused as a player because it's like you're not your attention isn't being broken by all of these broken tiles. Uh, maybe there's a, a genuine thing there. So anyway, uh, this ties all back to the responding to criticism thing. Uh, I think the only real way that we can get good responses to criticism is if the criticism itself, and the same for praise, by the way, like that's sort of why I, I try to bungle them together, is uh, when you're talking about praise and you're talking about criticism, you want them to be rooted in somebody's understanding of the game and you want to know how deep the, they understand the game. Like uh, another player uh, who, uh, somebody who had played CMPW, uh, Zishi, uh, was pretty quick to critique certain details about the game's balance. And uh, Mesk actually brought this up when we were breaking down some details about uh, Keen versus the Shambler in the Ascension VOD. But uh, I'll repeat a little bit of it here anyway. The, the, the gist of it was that rather than seek to adapt to the new format and the new uh, sort of meta, uh, Zishi simply said that, like, oh, this is bad and you shouldn't even try to defend the, the balance because uh, it's clearly Imba. Uh, when he had played maybe like five, six games or something at that point, right? So it's it's really difficult to form enough of an understanding. Even if you're a, a grandmaster level player like Hapsaya, you know, I can still beat him in an early game despite being much worse from a, a mechanical standpoint because I knowledge check him and I say, oh, you didn't know that you could lose to like Vulture, uh, you know, running across the map or whatever. Uh, even though you, you should think that that's probably true. It's like he's not aware of the timings. He's not really aware of the build orders. Um and like, you know, it doesn't actually end there, but like he feels behind enough that he's just going to GG out, even though he could probably stabilize because I'm that bad compared to him. So like, that's another case where, you know, in some ways I think maybe he knowledge checks himself by like thinking he's dead when he's not really. And then he GGs out too soon. But anyway, like that's one of the cases where it's like, you can be way better than me at the game. And maybe Zishi thought he was, but if you don't understand the project and you're just trying to map Brood War sensibilities onto it, then you're just going to end up feeling frustrated and feeling like somebody's killing you with like a meme strat or something when actually like I remember when Dead Infested first joined and Nablime Wraith rushed him and Dead Infested was like, I don't enjoy being memed on. And it's like, well, that was a legit build back then. And maybe it still is. Honestly, in some ways, it's a little bit more volatile now, but that was like actually a legit thing you could do. And so <laughs> to think of it from those terms, it's like, well, actually, <laughs> maybe you would want to do that. Like maybe you have to actually think about how do I counter mass Wraith? And not think about, well, that's a meme build, and he would never do that in a real game. Like, no, that's one of the ways that he got to the grand finals of the last tournament, bro. <laughs> so anyway, I think that when we're considering it from that standpoint, okay, we've got all of these, you know, ways that we can engage with feedback, be it positive or negative. 
Um, going back to the Benza example where he was breaking down and like giving me really grounded feedback about like this specific unit has this specific problem when in this specific situation or whatever, uh, he, he went through a few examples. It wasn't just the calculus and it's like, yeah, that's useful because you know, even if I don't agree at the end of the day with somebody's balance suggestion or readability complaint or whatever, like maybe somebody's not familiar with how something works and they get the wrong idea or whatever. Well, if it's if it's happening consistently for this particular unit, maybe I should look into that, right? So it's useful data to have, even if I can't immediately act on it. And I would say that's really helpful. Uh, but that 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 assumes a level of I, I I don't I feel like respect is too highfalutin a term to put out to bandy around here. But it's like, you know, you you do need to respect the sentience of the other people that are involved with this, and say like I've got if I if I like woefully disagree with something. If I really heavily think that they're making the wrong decision about say their unit names or the fact that air units are in the game or whatever, then I should probably, you know, complain about that, but in a way that, uh, explains from some, something resembling first principles, why I feel this way. Like what is, what is informing my opinion? Why do I think that, you know, uh, what, what did he, I'm trying to remember all the unit names that he complained about, uh, when he joined the server here. Uh, but it was something like, I know he complained about, uh, hypnagogue, but that's like a unit that's not even implemented yet. So I, I feel like maybe that's a bad example. Oh yeah. He complained about Ecclesiast. Like, I don't know why <laughs> that seems like a weird name to complain about. It's like, yeah. So like, I can't understand. I can't parse like why you think that's a cringe name. So you know, then he, he says that they're obtuse words or whatever. And it's like, well, not really. Ecclesiastes is actually fairly common. Like if you read any uh, history or if you read any, um, you know, I guess like fantasy fiction and stuff. Like, I don't know. It seems uh, seems weird. So like you, you got to explain it for, for more detail. Like what what is the response you have to this? Can you explain why like uh, why you think it happens or whatever? What's your point of view there? Um and, you know, like, what? Well, and, you know, sometimes it's helpful to also imagine a counter proposal. Like, if you were going to change the name, what would you change? And unfortunately, at that point, it was when he said that Ultralisk was better. <laughs> so, all right, buddy. Um, you know, that's like one case where it's like, okay, it sounds like we just deviate too much and maybe we can't really help each other there. And and that's fine. You know, you can just say, I agree to disagree. Like, this is this is our, our path here. Like, we are deciding to go down this road. It doesn't seem like you're, you're interested in following. So, you know, best of luck elsewhere, I guess. Um, and, you know, it is a shame in some ways when somebody is like, I really like this project, but the names are all terrible. <laughs> well, I don't know what to tell you, man. Like, uh, it's a weird complaint. I have never encountered that before. So that's why I guess it deserves some notice and some, uh, some uh, you know, reaction or, or whatever. Uh, but still, I guess like the broader point that I would use that example to make is about responding to criticism. I think uh, responding to critique, responding to... Uh, any sort of negativity in that sense. It's actually really useful. Like I enjoy, I, I, I think I'm at a stage where I can pretty much, like maybe if I was subjected to it 24 seven, it would be different. But you know, at the rate of where it's provided, even the negative cr uh, feedback, like I just, I remember I was in Twitch chat for somebody, I can't remember which streamer, but uh, somebody mentioned, or, or I mentioned CMBW or somebody mentioned CMBW and somebody in the chat said, is that that shitty Brood War mod? And Rather than get offended at the fact that he just, you know, denigrated all the work that had gone into the project and called it shitty, I asked him, uh, what is shitty about it in your opinion? Like, just for, for clarity. And I got no response, but that's sort of the reaction that I tend to have is, okay, somebody doesn't like it or thinks that it's bad or thinks that something about it is bad. Like, at least I know that somebody thinks this, right? There's like some data point there. I want to dig deeper and figure out like what specifically set them off or if it's not just one thing, like what are the, some of the things? And like, you know, maybe it comes out that they just don't like that it's different than Brood War. And well, in that case, that they're, it's not for them at all. Uh, but if there's like some specific thing, like, oh, I really don't like this thing about this unit, like the way that Benza was talking about how he can't really understand what's happening with this unit. It's like, oh, then suddenly that that feedback, which started out very base level and not very respectful and not very useful, becomes useful. Even if the respect never enters into the equation, I can still maybe harvest some useful thing about it. Like at the very least, I recognize and understand that somebody has an opinion about something in the project and maybe I can use that to at least jumpstart my own thinking of, well, do I share that opinion even a little bit? And if so, how could I maybe make it so that, you know, that opinion is no longer valid because I changed some aspect about the thing. So if it's my, if the opinion is, it's really hard to read what's happening with the calculus and I share that opinion, which I would say is probably like a, it's fair 
uh, critique considering all the overlays that end up going there. Then, you know, how can we how can we change that? Well, we can think about uh, removing the trail or making the trail a lot more uh, transparent or something so that it doesn't um, you know block so many pixels of the screen on the way out. Maybe it's less noisy. Uh, we can remove the uh, or or minimize the overlay, make the overlay a lot smaller for when it penetrates a target, and we can probably make the death animation a little bit less noisy as well. So there's a couple of things that we can turn as far as levers or uh, uh, handles, you know, there's levers we can pull to change that situation and make it better. And then it would be a lot harder to convince me that it was unreadable, you know, once we improve the readability. It sounds a little silly to when you break it down that way, but that's sort of the, the approach that I would take. So there's my uh, audio visuals, readability, and responding to criticism section. And uh, yeah, hopefully it was, uh, Hopefully it shows, like one of the things I really don't like the idea of is being in an echo chamber. And I know to some degree you're gonna be in an echo chamber anyway because you're you're kind of like, there's certain things that are true that we all agree or whatever, like we all agree are true. And, and some of those things are related to like game design and some of those things might be related to like aesthetic um, you know, like we, we don't like the, the toy look that we ha see in all these other RTS games that are coming out uh, most recently, a lot of the 3D games and stuff. Uh, and you know, that's like an aesthetic thing. And a lot of us have a deep appreciation for like mythology or, uh, you know, like uh, ancient religions and stuff or other cultures. And some of us think that uh, it's really cool to have like a lot of races or whatever. Like, you know, there's certain things that a lot of us agree or the majority of us agree on. And, you know, whether or not those are like precepts that everybody can agree on is probably probably not. But at the very least, we we have all of these sh this shared common ground. And that makes it a lot easier to have conversations. But once, you know, beyond that, like in the in the case of am I doing a good job? Am I going down the right direction? Is Cosmonarchy Brood War improving? The, the answers to these questions, I would like to be sober and genuine. And sometimes you can't get that when, you know, you have, a, uh, you know, people who are just going to say yes to, to anything that you, you ask them for, uh, which is, I think I've done a fairly good job of not falling into that trap. And I don't think that there are really that many people on the server that would uh, would fall into that trap either as the, uh, yeah, as the yes man archetype, right? I don't think we actually have too many of those. Um, but obviously I recognize that there's the propensity for that. There's a, the potential to fall down that rabbit hole. And so I've, I think I've steered clear of it, but I'm very allergic to the idea and very sensitive to the idea that like, oh, people on the internet might think that this Pronogo guy is just surrounding himself with yes men. And I don't know why that bothers me so much, but it's probably something I should just get over and deal with because at the end of the day, I don't think that's true. Uh, so I guess, uh, yeah, why, why get angry over it uh, or uh, mad or whatever? And um, that's not even really an accusation that gets bandied around a lot. Uh, so maybe I really am just in my own head too much about that. But I, I have this idea that like, I really want to respond to negative criticism in a way that turns it into something useful. And because I do that so much, I guess maybe it would it would irritate me a lot if people thought that I was just uh, banning people or kicking people or whatever, uh, or, or chasing people away who, who didn't immediately agree with everything in the project. I think, honestly, the fact that I'm partnering with a guy who for a long time disagreed with the gameplay direction that we went is kind of evidence to the contrary there, so... I don't know, but uh, anyway, hope you, hopefully that gave you a little bit of insight into how I respond to criticism and what I look to get from it, as well as a you know a, a general warning. You know, don't just surround yourself with people who pra praise you all the time. If somebody praises you and you don't even know them, don't take it to heart. Just like you would hopefully not take to heart criticism from people who also don't know you and who you, whom you do not know yourself. All right, let's talk a little bit about meta developments during Ascension number six. So yeah, uh, in the last tournament, right, Ascension number five, we actually had some interesting things occur in the group stage that set the tone for some of the future matches in playoffs. Uh, one of them was, of course, the advent of the six pool. Mystery Meat was in voice chat before the tournament began saying, I really wonder why we never see six pools and stuff. And then Three Crow decided to try it out and uh, absolutely get, get, get at Veek and uh, almost got missed a few times. Uh, and then of course, Enos in the very next group did it to Keen uh, and Keen responded in kind uh, as soon as he uh, was was dealt with, which is pretty funny. And then, you know, I mean, I guess the six, it wasn't a six pull when Enos did it, but it was like close enough, right? So uh, that was really good. And you know, we just saw that happen. But then 
In Group D, Luciferius pioneered Wraith spam and almost defeated the Shambler uh, on Boscovan uh, of all other maps, right? That's pretty pretty good there. So later on, we would see the, the six pool, seven pool, like the early pool, basically, uh, definitely come to fruition in ZVZ a few times. Uh, at the very least, like people tried it, even if it wasn't super successful. Uh, we also saw... Uh, the Wraith spam allow Nablime to take a series against Mystery Meat, which nobody would have necessarily predicted going into it. At least if it was going to be Nablime, I thought it would be Macro Games, but instead it was those, uh, which is really funny. And then uh, as a result, we actually saw Mystery Meat come up with his own idea of how to respond to that, which was use vassals, use lattices to sort of like throw the Terran off guard and spend more money on defense than they would normally. Uh, and then beyond that, uh, at that point, you can kind of run them over with gateway units because they have specifically tech to, to deal with the air or the uh, the lattice units in particular. Uh, so it ends up working out pretty well, I think, uh, that we end up in this, the longer tournament, right? That was the first double elimination tournament we ran. The longer tournament had some adaptations. It had some some theory crafting. It had some thoughts put into how the reaction was going to be, what the reaction was going to be. So I like that. I think it's really cool. And we are going to start to see evidence of that as the playoffs continue for Ascension number six. But we've already seen some interesting things. Uh, obviously, one of the things that happened is the Scythricor is sort of being rediscovered. But so is the Calculisk ahead of the tournament. Uh, and Hamster, you know, almost got a match against Mystery Me, a second match against Mystery Me using Scythricor spam. Obviously, Hamster also showed how powerful uh, dropping defenses can be as Zerg. I'm surprised that very few other people even attempt to do that sort of thing. It's kind of neat. It definitely, uh, you know, it's a little APM intensive, but it requires such a, a bizarre reaction from your opponent, and it's just so new and novel that people generally aren't too uh, sure how to respond to it, which I think is really cool. And then we obviously had the Mind Tyrant Rush, which then turned into the Solarian Rush. And uh, this is stuff that Three Crow's been up to. He's actually been practicing that sort of stuff against players in between tournament rounds. And he took a game off of Nablime using that strategy, the Solarian stuff. And obviously he uh, took uh, a game off of uh, Dead Infested in Groups using the Mind Tyrant Rush. So, like, what are we going to see in the future? Well, uh, obviously, uh, Three Crow's going up against Biddy B, and the latter of which is playing Random. So it's a little bit harder to come up with like a, a, a safe cheese in that sense, or a safe uh, like Tech Rush type of strategy. Uh, maybe the the one base uh, Argosy can can do it, but uh, you know that that kind of assumes that your opponent leaves you on an island. Like the the game that we saw it happen in was a game where there wasn't that much harassment in the early stages of the game. It was on Nitro Valley, and Three Crow took that versus Nablime. Nablime immediately countered by. You know, picking infinite velocity, a big map that requires the Solarians go across the map. Like, maybe it guarantees that you eventually get to them, but the amount that the Terran can maybe be ahead by that uh, by that point is uh, pretty high. And it also kind of guarantees that they'll have sun dogs out and stuff like that by the time the Solarians show up in any uh, significant amount. <clears throat> so there's also opportunities for early pressure and all this other stuff, right? Uh, and it looks like Nablime had some idea of how to respond to that. And, and I think in between, you know, we've I've discovered that Blackjacks do super well against stewards. And, uh, you know, they're pretty easily mass producible. And once the Solarians are dealt with, you can send a bunch of them to attack the base and stuff like that. And Matadors, which are unlocked by the same add-on, are also really, really good versus Protoss if you can uh, actually get them to stick to the targets, right? Uh, which maybe you can accomplish with drops or maybe you can accomplish with uh, simply just like working them into a, a combined arms type army. So who knows what's going to happen there. But it, it's really, really cool to see the... Uh, the, the way that the developments have gone, right? The way that um, people are figuring things out, right? And then, like, you know, what's the response to Calculisks in ZVZ? Well, it seems to be, like, Bactylisk, Sicrylisk. And you use the Bactylisks to deal with the... To sort of, like, force the engagement because the Calculisks want to get on top and, and negate their own range bonus, but also negate the bounces. And then the Sicrylisks still splash. So the Calculisks get torn up. Uh, that's, like, one response that you can have. Uh, the other of uh, others of which maybe uh, haven't yet been discovered, uh, but I think like you know you could definitely end up using. Um, I don't know. I, I kind of think convolusks would work because they also deal splash on this patch. Uh, obviously, it would be a little bit different on the pre-release update, but you know then you don't really get the brood spawn uh, because the way that it works is it always spawns real row cores from the convolusk and it spawns real lisks from the tech care core. The uh, mutation at tier three for the convalisk, which I think is actually absolutely busted. <laughs> so people maybe will build that in this uh, tournament here. Uh, we, we will see. 
Uh, but uh, yeah, there's definitely some options. There's definitely some things that you can you can kind of learn from that. And I think it's really cool to see people like discover something that seems OP or seems like really powerful and then respond to it in real time, like in the tournament, uh, sometimes between matches or uh, between games in the same series and sometimes between series as the days go on. And that's one of the beauties of double elimination too, is that a tournament uh, contender uh, from the top four or whatever can be dropped down to the lower bracket, like, you know, in this case, Keen, and he still has a chance to sort of, uh, you know, come on forward and like respond and adapt to a specific player, but also potentially other things too, like how uh, a certain player might uh, end up going in that way. I don't know, like if if, uh, there's a rematch between Keen and the Shambler at some point in the lower bracket, that would be like one example where, well, Keen can specifically say, hey, I fought against the Shambler earlier. So now let me, uh, let me punch him and let me, uh, let me learn and let me practice and that sort of thing. And uh, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. It's also really cool how the seeding has worked out this tournament because Keen ended up exiting in second place. And he, that meant that he had a, a rough draw going into a mirror matchup against a player who's been grinding out a lot of games recently in the, in the case of the Shambler. And then we had, um, Biddy B go out in, you know, go up in first place, but he, he's up against Hamster and Hamster got out in second place because he wasn't able to finish the job versus Mystery Me. I mean, I think it would have been Mystery Me if not Hamster, like if Mist goes out in second place, then he would also have gone against Biddy B. So it's kind of like you know, six and one, half a dozen and the other, in theory, Biddy B got the better draw. Um, so, you know, like then we ended up seeing it was a, it was a three and zero in favor of Hamster. Like Biddy B didn't look as competitive, right? So we get to see like interesting results right out the gate uh, from the quarterfinals where I think at least, you know, two of the, the series, right? Uh, the Shambler versus Keen and Biddy B versus Hamster had the potential to be really interesting uh, as far as like back and forth, the long series goes. And it didn't turn out that way, but it, there was definitely potential there. There was pregame hype there. And then, you know, also the fact that Three Crow was then practicing this ridiculous strategy that I don't think the blind had, had seen prior to it being deployed against him on Nitro Valley. I think it's actually really cool too, because it's like, oh, you know, okay, Three Crow's not the, the better player overall, but he's going up against uh, a player who's very passive. And so maybe that like, especially, um, it, it could especially enable uh, Three Crow to come out ahead with, you know, at least take a game. And he did. And that was really cool. I thought that was really neat. So absolutely something else that you're going to see going forward. So I do think that uh, Salarians, uh, as long as there's a Protoss involved, uh, will be an option. Uh, I don't think it's Mist's style. So if he rolls Protoss, doesn't seem likely. If Biddy B gets past three crow in the lower bracket, I suspect uh, that the Salarians will probably not show up from him either. And that, so that kind of really only leaves three crows the, as the sole hope. So th- in order for Salarians to continue to make a, a, a sort of stink, then you know we, we're going to have to see the loser of Neblon versus Hamster go up against Three Crow in the Elimination 2B game. And I'm not sure if that's actually going to happen. We'll get into the actual preview later on. But uh, that's like one case, right? Because I don't think Mr. Meat will do them, and I don't think Biddy will use them. So Salarians are really only being championed by one guy. But as long as that one guy is still in the tournament, you might end up seeing Terrans build more Blackjacks. You might end up seeing Zerg build more Calculisks to deal with the Stewards, right? Like Blackjacks and, and Calculisks specifically deal with the Stewards. Uh, most efficiently. And then, like, I guess you could mix uh, Vilthrilisk with the Calculus or whatever. For Protoss, you might just see Magisters, like Magister Epigraph or something like that. It's a much more cost-efficient solution. I think you can also go Mind Tyrant if it's not uh, focused down. Like, if your opponent has any lacks in, uh, you, know, a- you know, APM or whatever uh, in focus, there's, like, that uh, a five-second window or whatever where you can absolutely just start stealing the Solarians. Uh, you could also do Demiurges if you wanted to just attack them from further away. And kind of like threaten them. It's like, I'm dealing damage outside of your range. If you come to try to attack me, then you are going to be like potentially damaged and uh, and worship, you know, the, the Demiurge at that point. So uh, I do think that the Crisis of Faith passive is a, a big deal. Um, but, you know, beyond that, there's uh, there's probably some other options if I had to guess. I think like Charlatan or Cantavis Hallucination plus like Ground Army can probably defeat a lot of those things. Uh, actually, I think Charlatan... Yeah, you might be able to defeat the stewards with charlatan plus anything, <laughs> like charlatan atrius or something could be a, a really big, big move there, or or maybe charlatan dracodin because of the single target. Yeah, I feel like that might be better actually, but uh, or charlatan vagrant even. Uh, but you know, it, it, that's like assuming that the count is fairly small. Like another way to defeat Solarians is just to defeat the player before they get too many of them. Uh, so that's another thing you can keep in mind. <laughs> it sounds like a forehead strategy and a half, but it's legit. So that's a that's a thing. On the calculus side in ZVZ specifically, I do think that the 
onus is on the player, not going calculus to be defeated by that. But in theory, I actually think the ground army is more durable. And, uh, you know, the Bactylus Sicrolisk army, especially if you mix in like Protathalors later on, you can start to really pressure the, the base, which Calculisks can kind of do, but not to the same degree as like Protathalors can do. Um, they basically just outrange everything with impunity. So it's really hard for uh, in CVC for you to get away from that, I think. Um, and then, you know, the, there's other things that you can do as well, like versus any air units, particularly like the Solarian, which is super slow on a map that's sizable enough. You can just go attack their ground army or whatever. Uh, you can attack their bases. You can raid them. You know, in theory, the player, the Protoss player tries to put down engrams to stop that. But like, that's one example of where that's very cost, uh, inefficient, you could say. Um, especially like it's very, I would just say it's prohibitively expensive to, to do that for every single potential base. And then you eventually you start mining out and then the Solarian, which is on this update is 500 minerals. It's like, eh, that's a lot of money to be putting into something. So I don't know. Um, beyond that though, there's also, uh, other, there's, there's other things that I think are going to be really interesting. Like I think people are figuring out slowly, but surely that as a Terran matadors are super good against Protoss, but you have to actually get on top of them. So it's like, Matador drops are going to be a big thing, I think, going forward. I do think Blackjacks also scale pretty well. Like, if you do, like, Blackjack Shaman into, uh, you know, with some Matadors on the front line, that can absolutely do so, so wonderfully against Protoss. And then maybe you mix in some Goliaths for, like, Anti-Air or whatever if you need to... I don't know. Like, there's a lot of options, I think, for all of the races to come up with some sort of seemingly OP strategy that, like is mostly just OP to people who have never played against it before. And because they're novel, they have that like inherent, in, inherent advantage. Uh, but it also kind of increases the volatility of the player using it because maybe they haven't done it too much, you know, so they don't actually know what the limits of the build are. Um, so I don't know. There's definitely some interesting things that are going to happen. I think that's the beauty of double elimination in some ways is that it extends the life of the tournament, sure, but that means that there's more opportunity for people to really get stuck in on the update and... Uh, and change some of the, you know, figure out some things, like turn some gears, like what, what's going on? What can I do? The, the way that Mystery Meat, like essentially anti strated is a term that I'm borrow from Counter-Strike here. He anti strated Nablime and thought, this guy built all these wraiths. What can I do versus wraiths? And then like came up with this like lattice vassal play and then mass gateway behind it. It's like, that's really cool. It's really cool that that's a thing. So I, I was down for that. Let's go into the next subject, which is of course the actual playoffs preview for round two. Uh, we are talking about four series that are going to be cast today. Mystery Me versus The Shambler and The Blind versus Hamster. These have already been played. And uh, as a result, the replays are where we will be casting them from. Uh, Mystery Me versus Shambler is Random versus Zerg. I do think that Mystery Me is favored here. But I think Shambler, if it's like, if, if it's a random and, and you get Zerg, I feel like Shambler wins that. If it's a random and you get Terran, I feel like it's more even. And if it's a random and Mystery Meat rolls Protoss, I think Mystery Meat's favored. So it, a lot of it is actually up in the air. Uh, I also think that uh, if it's a four spawn map, I would favor Mist uh, more so than the Shambler. Uh, but I, I guess the exception could be High Water. Uh, I actually don't have the pick, pick ban in front of me, so I don't remember if that's even a factor in the series. Uh, but uh, what do we got here? Let's see. Okay, so it looks like we have the pick ban and high water was banned by uh, Mystery Meat. So that will not be a factor in the set. Uh, the pick ban is Derelict, Nitro Valley, Sideshow, and Victory Square. Those are the, the maps after the starter, and Mystery Meat picked Otherworld. Exidu, Infinite Velocity, High Water were the bans. So, yeah, as a result, um, I think Otherworld is actually really dicey. I think Shambler is favored on that map, uh, mostly because he's done a lot of practice on it. But again, it comes down to the. It really comes down to what Mystery Meat rolls. I think it's more even than it has been in past matchups where Mystery Meat's just three out of every single time. I do think that that's very, very different now. So, uh, yeah, if Mystery Meat rolls Protoss, favors him. If it's a four spawn map, slight edge towards Mystery Meat no matter what. Uh, Shambler favored on two spawn maps by comparison. And, uh, well, the only four spawn maps that we have in this pool of five maps that are available are Nitro Valley and Victory Square, so he probably doesn't even have to worry about that too much. But the Shambler uh, is definitely favored versus Mist's Zerg uh, because he's done a lot of ZBZ practice, and he just 3-0'd Keen uh, in a ZBZ. And then you look at the uh, Terran matchup, and I feel like that's more even. And if it's like the longer the game goes, the more I favor Mystery Meat, but we'll have to see. So that's that's going to be an exciting one. The fact that we're getting that as a semifinal is pretty cool. Uh, I thought maybe we wouldn't get that matchup until later. So pretty cool stuff. And then the upper semifinal number two, Nablime versus Hamster. So interestingly enough, Hamster defeated Nablime in a seven game set on Sideshow when they were just playing to practice. And uh, that, that was a, a four to three. It was all seven games. 
and uh, Hamster only narrowly won out on it. So I think they're, like, in theory, they would be evenly matched. But Hamster just looked so unaffected by Biddy B in the quarterfinals, whereas Nablime had to struggle a little bit versus Three Crow and thus put more games on. And I don't know if Hamster went back and watched that series, but he might be aware of certain ways that he can, you know, abuse Nablime's play style. He might be aware. He's definitely aware of the cheeses. He's definitely aware of, like, the the float the stockade into the base. That was actually one of the, the games won in that seven-game set I mentioned. And it just, I look at that and I think to myself, like, God damn, man, like, Nablai versus Hamster, that's going to be another really good matchup, too. And I honestly think I favor Hamster in it, even though Nablai's got the longevity, Nablai's got the experience, Nablai's theor- theoretically, like, had a harder path here, uh, where, like, it seemed like Three Crow was a, a harder opponent for him in theory. But, like, j- the play style just favors Hamster. The, the, the stylistic matchup, I think, gives Hamster the edge. So I'm interested, man. I'm really looking forward to it. We could see Hamster make it to the upper final, which guarantees you a top four placement in his first ever Ascension tournament. So that, that could be a genuine outcome here. This could be like a 3-1 or 3-2 in favor of Hamster. Uh, if Nablime takes it, I think it's also going to be a similar scoreline. Basically, I think we're guaranteed at least four games out of the set. Um, we'll see if there uh, are more. But I, I, do, I don't think it could be a 3-0 for either player. I, I think it's actually the same for Mystery Meat versus Shambler because of Mystery Meat's randomness. So I think we're, we're at least four games in for all of the different matches. Uh, so we'll, we'll have to see about that. But uh, I mean, obviously they sent me five replays because that's something that I requested, right? So that's really cool. I don't really have much to say about Keen versus the Beaver. I think maybe the Beaver could take a round, but I think Keen is favored to take the whole set pretty comfortably, actually. Uh, that one will be played live along with Three Crow versus Biddy B. So that's going to be exciting to get those those games live as opposed to uh, from replays. Now, uh, the thing about Keen is he has to go up against the loser of Mystery Me versus the Shambler. If it's the Shambler, he has to rematch against the Shambler. And I'm, maybe then I would say he could, he could beat the Shambler and eliminate him. Mystery Me, on the other hand, I... F- feel like no matter what happens, like in ZBZ, okay, Keen probably wins. But in any of the other matchups, Keen just doesn't have that much experience with it. That's the one thing about the Beaver playing Terran, is that Keen doesn't have much experience playing against Terran. He's just getting cheesed, and like he has no real awareness of the project and stuff versus Terran. <laughs> the most he's ever gotten is ZBZ. So it's kind of interesting in that respect, where like that's why I think maybe Beaver could take a map. Uh, but Keen is like very, very far ahead in terms of mechanical skill, RTS skill. He just doesn't have the project knowledge. And honestly, I don't think the Beaver has played against a lot of Zerg himself. So it feels like maybe he's in that weird situation where I just worry that uh, the beaver will get rolled over again. Uh, But I feel like he could put up a a stronger fight this time around. So we'll see about that. It is his birthday today. So it it would be kind of epic if he could actually make it a little bit deeper before getting rolled in the semis. Uh, But, you know, I'm not sure that Keen will give him a birthday present in that sense. He might just like... You know, let it let him win once and then destroy the rest of him. Who knows? He's Keen's a funny guy. So going into the last set that I have to preview for you guys, that is Biddy B versus Three Crow. Uh, so I do think Three Crow is favored here because of Biddy B's randomness. I feel like if he rolls anything other than Protoss, it's going to be a tough game. If he does roll Protoss, then he, I think he should win, actually. I think Biddy B should uh, have the edge in that matchup there. Uh, but Three Crow is not actually as much of a one-trick pony as I thought. He had some interesting plays against Nablime on Sideshow in a match that ultimately, like, wasn't really that um, related to the Argosy. Like, I think the Argosies went down, like, super late in the game. Uh, he was behind for most of the game, and maybe you can say that Nablime should have won sooner or something, but, like, he did held on, and he did absolutely smash some shit up and, like, continuously defeat the third before it could get up and, and all this other stuff, right? He... He didn't ma- remain even, but he like he kind of stabilized in a situation where he was behind. He didn't fall more behind than he was for a while. Like he was behind, but he didn't like that didn't get worse, right? Usually it it, it like sort of uh, you have to claw your way back or you fall deeper down the hole. And he kind of like latched on somewhere <laughs> instead of falling or climbing. He wasn't able to climb, but uh, you know he didn't fall any further. So that was surprising to me, and that was a game without any Solarians. So. I do think that means that, you know, in theory, I don't know, Protoss versus Protoss, you know, if that's something that, you know, three-crow scouts from him, he's like, he might just go for some ridiculous tech rush again. He might go for the Mind Tyrant rush again, because it does work best versus Protoss, since they have lower numbers of units, and the individual units are more powerful, so they can swing a fight more powerfully, more, more quickly. Uh, and then we look at something like the match versus... Uh, like the, the matchup uh, versus Zerg, like BDB's worst race is Zerg. So it kind of feels like, he'll, you know... 
three crow can win maybe kind of early in that kind of matchup, which is not something I would normally say about three crow. And then we go into Terran. Biddy B's a, a you know middle race, right? His his, his middle of the road race, uh, but the what the race that might be the most susceptible to a Solarian rush, right? So that's also something to, to be considered. So it feels like ultimately, because Terran has to be a little bit more passive in the early game. If he rolls Terran, it's Solarian. If he rolls Protoss, it's a more fair fight. But maybe it's like some other tech rush, or maybe it's just a standard game. And then if he rolls Zerg, I don't really know what he can do to win. He might have to like seven pool or something and just cheese him. Uh, and, and maybe he could do that, actually. So I, I think this is also a four-game set. Uh, I think Biddy B will have at least one win under his belt. Uh, but I do favor Three Crow in the set. So we'll have to see how that one goes. And uh, it, it hurts me to say that, because I know Biddy B will listen to this. Uh, and uh, Three Crow will, of course, as well. But Biddy B, my man, uh, I can't say that I favor you anymore. You, you, you just you destroyed your own Matrix against Hamster in a match that you would have won otherwise. You let me down, son. I mean, Dad. So anyway, no, obviously, hopefully he bounces back. I mean, I want a, I want a good, good series. And it doesn't have to be clean either. I want a good, cheesy series. That's what I want. Um, because r- really, if we're honest, neither of these two players are favored to get deeper than the, uh, the top six, you could say, right, from the upper semis. So, you know, in that sense, just go out with a bang, brother, without killing your own stuff, ideally. And that's that. I mean, looking at that, if we, uh, if we think about you know, how the rest of the tournament's going to go. It's probably pretty epic, probably going to be pretty nice. But hey, we've got more than just another tournament or this tournament. We, we've got another tournament. And we also have some absolute smashing that's going to happen related to a qualifier, if you can believe it. So let's talk about that. And since we're about to talk about the qualifiers, I should mention that the qualifier is for Ascension number seven. And the reason I say that is because if you take seven, uh, specifically Veek seven, and you multiply it by four, you get Veek 28. And if you add three to that, you get 31, which is the episode that this is in. And here's Veek to join me for the rest of the Hi. episode. <laughs> What's up, dude? What's up? Okay. Yeah, I was just, I was thinking I can chime in since I'm not doing anything interesting and I know you were recording, so yeah. So here we are. So how, yeah. how do you feel about the uh, fact that there's a qualifier? And not only is there a qualifier, but you're actually in it. What's up? Yeah, I am. And I hope I will qualify. But there's, the thing that I had to do is register for it. And that was a lot of questions. I think there's like 10. And they were like pretty interesting <laughs> i mean basically i was expecting it to like check the the hour of, for for sunday or whatever and then there's like another day i'm thinking okay yeah it's two days that makes makes sense and then there's another day and yeah another day and another day yeah so that was funny i just wanted people's availability for the uh, every day of the week because i don't think this is going to be held the same way that we do like group stages where it's all in one day so i just wanted to get everybody's availability for every day in the week in case like that that will help me sort of decide d- devise brackets or whatever the other thing too is that i was debate there's a couple of different ways you can do this sort of thing because I, again i come from a counter-strike and, and brood war background when it comes to watching competitive gaming and one of the things that sometimes happens in the counter-strike case is they'll have like two or maybe even four separate qualifiers and like the first place or the top two will be the ones to, to get the spots in the tournament uh, and then like, OK, well, if there's if they need to qualify eight people, say, then uh, or maybe four people in the case of what we've got, then maybe we do two separate qualifiers. And the first qualifier qualifies two people in. And then the second qualifier will also qualify two people in. But the idea is that like, well, the second qualifier doesn't have those other two people in. So you imagine if it was like really top heavy, like you and Hupsai are currently the highest skill players that have. Uh, signed up and so in theory the two of you would make it through like say the first qualifier and then you're you're sitting there looking like well what's going to be the next qualifier uh like the next one will, won't have those two in it so you'll have an opportunity for like the the next like best players to get in right uh, so we could right. do it that way if we were going to do it there i haven't exactly decided if that's going to be the format i just know that if we do two separate qualifiers we could do single a limb but if we I'm don't curious, what, be what is the Is there a big difference between like doing one qualifier and taking top four and doing two qualifiers and taking top two twice? Uh, In theory, you could do the the two separate qualifiers faster because they'd be single elimination. So it's like depending on the number of players, it would be less games, right? Uh, But you might also get a bit more volatility than that. Like I think the ASL qualifiers, I know they are single elimination and there's like four of them or something or maybe even more than that. Uh, and they only take like the very top player. 
So sometimes yeah. you can get like weird cases where somebody who's favored to get in gets like a, sniped by some ladder player nobody's ever heard of. And then <laughs> that guy just doesn't do anything, right? He just gets banged out the next round. Uh, which would sort of be like similar if in the playoffs, like you go to the lower bracket and like somehow because free throw six pulls me. Yeah. Or like, you know, uh, right now we have a, a matchup coming on later today, the Beaver versus Keen. And it's like, oh, it's the Beaver's birthday and he wins. And it's like, well, yeah. I, you know, Keen could do some damage in the next round. I don't think Beaver can, right? Like if he's going up against either Mr. Right. Meter or the Shambler, depending on who loses the upper semi. And it's like, well, he probably can't win against those players. So, you know, like as much as it's like a triumphant upset and it's kind of interesting and surprising and ooh, la la, it's still kind of lame because it's like, well, we know he's destined for, you know, an exit afterwards, right? So, like, from a storyline narrative perspective and not nothing to do with, like, my personal uh, opinion of any player, it's just you would want Keen to win that match from a, a, an uh, upset standpoint. Like, you wouldn't want him to be upset because it's I, we can't really say that the Beaver would be a contender, whereas Keen could realistically power up and be a contender depending on who he ends up fighting against. So that's uh, just another sort of like way yeah, that it would be like important. a short term surprise, but you would already know that he's like gonna yeah. be destroyed the next match. So like I can, I can psych myself up and believe that Keen could win the whole tournament from this point, despite being eliminated or uh, dropped down to the lower bracket in the first round. I can still believe that I can see a way that it could happen. And mm. I can't see that for the Beaver. So that's sort of like a way to think about it. Right. It's like, yeah, there's no storyline. Right. Right. Yeah. Like in the three crow versus Biddy B series, I can't see either of them winning either. So it's really is just that's like a case where it's kind of like a grudge match for like who's going to be the top dog in the class twos. And then who's it's like who has the privilege of being eliminated by Nablime or Hamster, depending on who loses that match. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. we're fighting for who's, who uh, gets killed by the king later or something. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. But yeah, like. The qualifier side, I think, is really interesting. I mean, we already have five signups, and it's not even been a full 24 hours. Uh, I think that that will continue. Like, that um, that already proves the point, right? Because, like, I was going to do open signups in theory for the next tournament. But if we have the top eight of this tournament, the ones that are in playoffs, sign up for the next tournament or, like, re-up and, and claim their spots that they've been they've earned by going to playoffs, then we already have one more player than is fitting in the in the tournament. And this is without people like Skoller, Dead Infested, Moon Hunter, Enos, uh, you know, maybe other people who have talked about it. Yeah, well, it depends did sign up to the qualifiers. So oh, I see. Know. Yeah, the, the five we have right now are you, Hapsaya, Benza, It Depends, and Lucy. So we have that five. Mm. And then we have, like, more people that are already, like, they, they signed up for, as ringers for the last tournament or, or they were in the last tournament group stage or whatever. So, Dude, I was, you know. I was very tempted to sign up as random because I think I would be capable, but I chose to sign up as the easiest race instead. So, <laughs> yes. uh, it gives me higher chances, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, Hapsai is also Protoss, and he's the, like, most mechanically skilled player that we have for sure. Like, well, by I far, was able so. to out-micro him today, so... Did you outmicro him with Solarians, though? They don't require No, Dracodans. Oh, shit. So, oh, shit. It's pretty cool. But then he figured out some other build, and and that was that destroyed me eventually. So Interesting. Okay. Yeah. But you guys are know playing a lot of games. Uh, cast so. those, yeah, at some point, I'll have to. Like, the thing is, like, the fact that Hapsaya, I, I think putting him in a title is already kind of an accomplishment, you know, a video title. So Yeah, we, right. We, we, need, to, we need to get him around there and uh, see what we can do. Like, that. that's pretty cool. I mean... Unfortunately, because he's, like, not a yes man when it comes to, like, Blizzard and stuff, uh, the community of StarCraft 2 doesn't seem to like him very much. Oh. <laughs> but, you know, that's okay. He's uh, he's a cool guy. He, he's He's been streaming yeah. occasional games, like FFAs and stuff, that we've been doing uh, in CMBW. It's, like, the first time a streamer's picked up the project and just decided so The Solarium so. thing is actually pretty funny because he... I beat him the, with Solarians, and he was like, what, what beats them? And I, I said, I don't know, OP. <laughs> and he was like, uh, he was like trying some unit after after the game, and, and uh, he tried the, oh, what, what is that? Is it Lattice? No, Lattice is the production. So it's the, oh, it's the Corsair. No, Land know. Effect. Land yeah. Effect, yeah. yeah. Uh, that didn't work either, so. No, you uh, wouldn't be able to but, use those too much. You were on pre-release, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I realized that oh, you have mind tyrants, so yeah, GG. Yeah, mind tyrants would definitely do it. Uh, mind tyrants are really good against Protoss, which is funny because I didn't necessarily think that that would happen, but that's kind of more thematic since they're meant to be these like profane units that you would never like. You yeah. should, you're dishonorable in some way if you build them. Right. Like you, in, in you, more. you build mind tyrant to mind control a uh, Sir Severine to blast uh, <laughs> the planet. So yeah. you're. 
Doubly profane. Yes, yeah. Yeah, or, or my entire in a demiurge so that the demiurge can control a star sovereign. Triple triple profane. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's so, go. Yeah, there's all sorts of cool stuff that I think is really neat. Um, I definitely feel like, you know, I felt this way about going from Ascension 5 to Ascension 6, that the, the update made the game much better from a, a, me, a meta standpoint or, like, what's um, expected, I guess, of the... Uh, the or, or like you know what, what what's the the easy way to win well maybe if there is no easy way to win that's better uh but if if the way to win if the agreed upon way to win is like using rts mechanics in a more sane sense instead of like all these gimmick cheeses and stuff which i think is partially by the way like the reason why that even happens to begin with is because a lot of players maybe can't win in a straight up macro game anyway like they don't have the rts fundamentals to to match somebody i like, like, really like Zachman. yes yeah well the blime also really likes the the madrigal and so hopefully he does and hate the new magical, oh, yeah. you know. So, uh, but yeah, I really like the new yeah. revision. I'm just not sure about the numbers yet. We'll we'll see how that works. Yeah. Well, one thing but... I was thinking is that the missile speed might want to be increased so it like can stay. In theory, it's, it attack hits fast. It doesn't change anything about the attack rate, but like because the damage the time between the salvo firing and the damage being taken is is shorter then maybe the magical could stay alive longer because the unit that is attacking it dies faster or something like that i was thinking about that uh, for the furia mode the other thing by the way veek while we're on that topic that i was thinking about is it would be really epic if we replaced imperiosa missile with just a single target salvo of just non-stop furia missiles and then it's like the same Aww. like I thought about maybe making it so that it uh, does that while moving, like it can shoot while moving, but that's that's basically the cyclone in that seeds. So instead, it would just be like, <laughs> <laughs> like they, they have the same weapon range, the same damage for each individual missile, but it's it's sort of like the Evigralisk, where the Evigralisk while moving attacks four targets, but then if it's standing well, still, they still it have kinetic pen because that could be interesting. No, it would just be the straight salvo. I mean, the idea is that it wouldn't be the Imperioso mm. missile at all. Well, what I really like about Imperioso right now is that it kind of has like an established gameplay pattern where you want to like, mm -hmm. you want to weaken them up with Imperioso to finish them up with Furia. Mm. Or you might need uh, like some other support because uh, right now Furia is uh, a lot of DPS, but it's spread around the unit. So you yeah. would need something to like finish off. So you either need to weaken up the units with Im Imperioso or you need other yeah. units basically so i think that's neat about the current version but yeah it's it's uh, it's neat it's uh i was kind of thinking about how you would even explain how it has two different missiles that are so different in size and <laughs> fires so many of them but we just kind of gloss over this or whatever mm. um yeah the other thing too though is <clears throat> I, i'm i'm very interested in seeing like Maybe the, the proposed revision that I just came up with where it's like single target salvo of just nonstop attacks is better for like some factional spinoff or something. Uh, because mm. one thing that's cool about the Imperioso is that it is crowd control, just like the Fury missile is crowd control, but it's a different kind. Um, so I like that the, the unit is about splash damage in some way or like multi-target or whatever um no matter what like no matter what mode it is it kind of cements the identity of the unit it's just i was thinking of like yeah, a way it's to... also good to contrast it with with siege tank which is uh, with phalanx which is more like single target it has aoe but it's like more it's a, a lot more upfront damage and it's like burst right it's like a, a nuke yeah, yeah. almost as opposed to a steady amount of damage and maybe that's something like maybe we could do uh interception or kinetic pen or whatever uh for the uh, the single target salvo uh, and that could be like used as a way to uh, keep the idea uh, but I don't know I'm just I was just thinking about that like I feel like the madrigal will be a lot less of a like a it, usually you use madrigals in a very binary way where it's like well did you have enough defenses to stop the drop if not you say goodbye to your workers yeah, you know yeah. and so that feels pretty weird as like we wanted to go away from equipment checks with like detection and stuff yeah, yeah. Uh, so we're, we kind of want to do the same thing with like any cases where it's like you know I, I think it's still yeah, valuable to have anti-drop healthier right yeah. now uh, that they don't shoot like they basically have variable uh, attack rate depending on the amount of uh, targets but uh it shifts their identity a lot. They're not as boost oriented. So I, I was thinking initially that they could just like have plus 100 health or something and it would be fine. But uh, what I also like about them right now is that you just, uh, you can just, you can no longer just have like two and have that be all you need. Mm -hmm. You you need either you need more madrigals or you need support units, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's also a lot healthier. 
Yeah, I was a little wary about significantly increasing their durability because one of the things that I kind of wanted to do, especially now that I've increased the weapon range for the Furia missile, mm. is I wanted to make it so that you're getting efficacy from a further amount of range and that's sort of like offsetting the fact like that that gives you more room to have a front line because there's more range uh between yeah, yeah, its enemies right yeah that also works i think yeah and and with air units also getting you know a lot of blanket nerfs to their top speeds it kind of feels like there will be less opportunity not not that it'll be completely gone but there will be less opportunity for you to snipe them uh, so like you have to commit a little bit more to snipe them depending on what units you're using. Like, I guess if you're using Protoss tier two air, like, uh, the Aurora spam or Panoptices or something, you probably, cause they're not getting nerfs to their speeds, but the Stargate itself is a bit more expensive now. So it's like you're investing more into it. So it becomes a, mm. like, no matter which one you're going for, I haven't done Terran tier two air yet, but that's something that I'm, I'm still crunching the numbers on basically. Uh, but like, so far, for Zerg Air and for Protoss Air, it's more expensive no matter what. For Terran Air, it'll likely be... So what I found mm. about Terran Air, by the way, mm. is that the Tier 2 stuff, it feels, it feels very vital to their mid-game. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not sure exactly uh, how it would impact their mid-game, right? Because yeah. uh, it feels like without Sandogs, you will have like problems with, like, for example, Solarians and other things. Uh, because you get, uh, what you unlock with t tier 2 is you get machine shop, which is, uh, like the, it's useful for fortifying positions, I'd say, and then you get, like, mantle. Yeah. Uh, and captaincy, and they all are great at fortifying, but they're not really good at, like, sniping stuff and at being mobile. So that's basically the niche that Starport covers. Well, the, and the it feels specific, like a vital thing, right? Yeah, the I do think that the what do you call it? The mobility is in question for Terran a lot. Um, they don't have a tier two transport; they only have tier one and tier three, and that kind of right. uh, constrains what they can do. But I also feel like that's only like there's a lot of moving parts here. One of the issues is that air is so ubiquitous because for all races, air is really strong, and now that air is getting less strong with progressive changes in the meta, I think we're oh. going to see ground armies become more the default, and that will mean that relative to the competition, yeah, yeah. the ground armies will be more uh, evenly matched in terms of mobility. Uh, so that's right. definitely one thing. But the other thing, too, is that, like, Bio got a mobility update. Uh, Maverick, Cleric, Madcap, Heracles, Striga are all faster uh, by something co close to 10%, depending on the unit. Um, Mantle units got, uh, besides the Cataphract, got a movement speed reduction, but Ramses now have three armor pen, which means that they will penetrate stewards. So they kind of emerge as the successor to the Blackjack in that respect, where the Blackjack just destroys stewards. And now Kinetic Pen will also apply to them from the Ramses. So, um... Wait, Ramses is the melee one? Yeah, it's the small one. Durandal is the melee one. Durandal was also made smaller, oh, but it has... Ramses. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, the mineral only one. Yes, yeah. So... Yeah, it makes sense. So, like, basically I made it so that mech is a more slow, and bio is more fast, and then with air becoming reined in sort of irrespective of that, I think that will... The confluence of factors will basically be that, like, if you want a mobile ground army, you'll go for oops, you'll, you'll smash. And if you want, if you want a mobile ground army, you'll go for bio. If you want a mobile, uh, like a, a more slow, steady mech crawl, I mean that's that's mech. And you can go air, but air is still it, it's it's slowly but surely becoming more of a supportive role. Or like I'm so far ahead, so I can mask this stuff because it's a bit more volatile. It's more expensive. It has less durability relative to ground units of the same cost. Um, well, so, you know, that's sort of... I don't always have this advantage that it gives you more map control than uh, ground units. It's just not as good in upfront combat. Yeah. So... And, like, the, one of the problems with the game was that it was as good in upfront combat, and now it's, yeah. be, you know... Yeah, I was crying was... about that for months. <laughs> <laughs> well, we eventually so. got to a point where we saw, like, one of the things that I'm... I, one of the things that I talked about before you joined was the whole like adaptation in the middle of a tournament, the meta development in the middle of a tournament. And yeah, it's like, yeah. okay, Solarians emerge as this unit. And one of the things I said was, well, there's loads of things that I found that like counter them, like blackjacks being one that you would never expect. So yeah, that was <laughs> something when you posted that today, I was like, surely that doesn't work. No. Yeah, it does. Like but... I, I built like 
I had like a dozen blackjacks and they just eviscerated all the stewards. They have a lot of DPS for me. Yeah, yeah, they do. And they and it's hit scan, so there's no travel time for the missile, which means that they usually yeah, pop the uh, right. stewards before they can actually attack anything. And so especially if you have a target other than the blackjacks for them to attack, like if you're on the offensive versus a Salarian and you have like a, a ground army, like this, the, the stewards fly around that target, the first target, say you have like Harakens or Matadors or whatever on the front. And it's like, okay, they're going to target that first. And even with Matadors, it's even better because they will automatically acquire that target anyway, because it's also attacking air. Like the Matador, when not deployed, attacks air. So it's like, Okay, and I, I've got this front line, and then there's all these hit scan attacks just eviscerating all the stewards. Like it happens pretty easily. And on pre-release, the, the stewards even have uh, long, twice as long build time to reassemble. So you, your Stellarians are out of commission for longer. Um, mm. You know, so that's something that, like in this tournament, that's not going to be a factor. But like the blackjack matador combo still definitely does pretty well with them. So I don't know. Like it's it's really funny that like, and it, it, maybe funny is the wrong word. It just it's satisfying when people initially say holy shit that's really powerful and i think slowly but surely people are realizing wait even if you know it's going to change or even if pronigo agrees it's overpowered or overtuned or, or not what he wants in this tournament there's still time for me to adapt and there's probably things i can do to adapt like the rate spam felt uh, really suffocating in the last tournament and then mystery me found a way around it and it's like you know at, at, at the very least you can always go for something that stops it from from happening like the, one of the best counters to Salarians is making it so that they can't afford it <laughs> or like feel like they can't yeah, yeah, actually yeah, get definitely. it out. Right? So I don't know, it's cool. I think it's well, the, interesting. The match I played against Hamster that really made me think that they are still a bit overpowered is when he... So basically he had a Drakadon of Tecton army mm -hmm. that I was fighting with Phalanxes. And then once he had one carrier, it was basically GG. Uh, because he was able to protect his carrier and, like, actually yes. uh, siege my position, basically. And I wasn't able... I, I don't know if that was before the range. I, I think, I think it, it was before, yeah. Because the, the yeah, hamster matches it definitely were was before like. It was before Goliath got its armor pen yeah. increased, too, so... Yeah, the Goliath's armor pen means that they deal full damage to stewards where previously they didn't. So that will actually help versus mm. the the Salarians. It wasn't really meant to make it so that... I mean, they will technically be more effective versus the Salarian, but it wasn't meant to make it more f effective for that. It was like, you can just use the Goliaths to snipe down the stewards, but you can also use Blackjacks, which I think most people would never guess. So. <laughs> yeah. Right. Especially if you're at Tier 2, you're not thinking, I need a Tier 1 add-on for this Fulcrum. <laughs> it's like, no. Most people would never think that. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's definitely in an interesting spot. You were actually, I guess we, since you're here, we can talk a bit about uh, one of the other things that came up was um, at the onset of Ascension 6, uh, at some point I had messaged you and uh, we talked about, we talked a little bit about balance or like the direction the game had gone. And you said that you felt like it was going in a direction you didn't like, but since then you've played a lot of games. So has your opinion on that changed now that you've gotten more experience under your belt? Like, do you feel like it's... Uh, Heading in the right direction? Do you think that there's still some critical things wrong with it? What do you What do you reckon? Um, so I feel like currently you have to take trade offs when you're in the early game, basically. So where you cannot, uh, you basically often need to cut something to gain some other advantage, which I guess can be healthy too. So I'm not exactly sure how I like it. But basically, um, I mean, the game is definitely uh, better if you are able to like learn matchups better mm -hmm. or whatever. So I think that that helps a lot. But at least for Terran opening, I felt like it was a bit... Uh, like with with Predators, I I find the early game really uh, way better because you go gateway and you like can do like a two dracad in pressure or something. You can even add two gateway potential, a second gateway potentially, and eventually expand, which I feel like is is neat. But with Terran and doing Grax expand didn't feel very very good because he like the money didn't. I didn't have enough money to build like Expo. Mavericks and Bunker, and Mavericks basically die to everything in the early game. So that didn't feel very satisfying. But other than that, I feel like I can more or less play the opening game uh, and be satisfied with it. 
It's just I I have to switch to a lot more pressure than I used to. Is I I used to be more of this macro player that just like plays safely and mm -hmm. takes all the minerals and like out macros people, but I feel like that playstyle is not as powerful as it once were. Uh, as, as once was and mm -hmm. pressure is way more important now yeah you have to be more proactive that's one of the things that i look at in a blimes play style and i feel like even in games that he's ahead in he really doesn't close them very quickly he does like to choke out the map he likes to you know in that game um he played a game against three crow in the quarterfinal number three the last match on infinite velocity the way that he wins at the end of it is by building a bunch of diadems and like leapfrogging them forward behind his front as he's pushing in. And it's like, he definitely didn't need to wait for all that. He could have won at any point for like, the, mm. <laughs> you know. The yeah, so before. when you actually uh, cast a replay session, some of them, when I, when I go pressure, it feels like I'm winning even, even though like basically I wouldn't expect to win out of a pressure. Mm. And then when I was playing defensively, I was really struggling. So. Mm. Uh, that was interesting to, to find out, although... It might also be down to the player uh, as well, because if you're playing against Hamster, he really excels when you leave him alone. And if you're playing against mm. Upsaya, I mean, that's probably the same for him as well. I mean, like, as a broad truth, it's probably true, but it's like, I can leave Nablime alone and really not worry about anything, right? Like, that's well, just Upsaya nice completely thing. destroyed me when he, when he patented his Golem Legionnaire build. Oh, interesting. Uh... It's actually pretty cool how it works because legionaries will chase you down and golems uh, want you to not run away. Mm. So either you get destroyed by legionaries or by golems. <laughs> and then I, I tried to go legionary Drakaden as a response and uh, obviously golems are good uh, against legionaries, but I will not spoil much more because okay. uh, those are potentially castable. So. Yeah, yeah. But. Should be interesting. Yeah, you, you also mentioned that you're back to making maps. You made a map called Fata Morgana that I haven't looked at yet. And you said uh, that yeah, it's more... Yeah, another one. Yeah, you, you said that it's more skirmishy than you were maybe in, uh, initially intending. So uh, you, you also said that you uh, learned well, a lot. Well, I think so. this is uh, a property of what I... Is that I, I decided to make maps that have a normal minimap size. Mm. So 128 on either of the dimensions. And this one is 128 by 96, and okay. it's X symmetry. So the rush distance is not that uh, high. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, and the middle, the middle also controls the the access to a lot of bases. Although I tried to improve it with revisions, and I think it's way better now. Mm -hmm. However, it's still the games can swing if uh, if someone gets an advantage, basically. I see. So although can, you can take map control, mm -hmm. although not in the middle because it's unbuildable, so it's like uh, right okay. new ones, I guess. But and the new map uh, I haven't played on yet. But it's interesting. It's definitely more macro heavy, mm -hmm. and BTB called it a spiritual successor to Repulsion. So that's oh, that's interesting. interesting. Yeah. Uh, but it could be interesting. Could be an interesting map. I I'm pretty happy with um like the the layout of it. So. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, it's interesting to me to see. Um... Well, it's, it's always good to see you back into mapping. Obviously, uh, you, you were disappointed that you didn't end up having any maps that went into this tournament. But uh, the, the best match of the, of the game so far, bar none, was on yeah, Nightfall, Nightfall, right? So, and the old Nightfall. Which, yeah, which probably surprised know. you a bit because I remember you, you, you weren't really happy with that map. But well, like, I revised it. Yeah. Then. So that, that's sort of like, I mean, I, the best match prior to that was on Death Spiral, and I don't think that Death Spiral was a particularly good map. It was just a bit wacky, and it had, like, th somehow the right recipe, right? And, like, even the players who played on it were like, I don't like this map. But they both agree that it was a really good match. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, I, it's, you know, that's just it's, the way it's it It's weird, goes. because I, I look at Death Spiral, I think, even today, and, and it feels like the map flow is very chaotic, because you have so many different pathways, mm -hmm. and yet the center... The center is like a corner where you don't actually want to go there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which is which is weird. It was, I was I was trying some wacky things and then I reshaped the layout at some point, but not not like fully. Like in order to really do the changes that I should have done to that map, it would have basically been a new map. And by that point, I was like, eh, probably not. But like that's the I almost think of that that era as like the Dark Ages. Like we had so many maps in, and maybe I'll just yeah. always think about Dude, that. I era, remember but, when yeah. you. I started like pushing safe maps at one point, and you were like very disappointed that I'm going that direction. Now, now you're like 
twice as safe or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's just getting it's safer and safer. Funny. Well, I also think it's a bit of an experiment to have safe maps, but also like people think that, for example, high water is an unsafe map because of the fact that you have this like drop placement or like vertical low vertical distance and stuff for air units. Mm -hmm. And I also feel like as air units get less and less. Um, useful from a mobility standpoint, or well, powerful. Or it completely depends on where you spawn. I yes. think. which I I, I don't so. mind that personally. Like I think it's in a cross map position, or even in a horizontal spawn position, it's actually really like fairly safe. You can get up to three bases pretty quickly. But if you, or I should say, pretty safely, similar to sideshow actually. But it's like opening up past that is actually where the challenge comes. It's like if I'm horizontal spawn, maybe I don't even want my top temple base. Maybe I want to just expand to another main like super fast. And that's harder for some races than it is for others. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. But then in a cross spawn map position, it's like, oh yeah, I can just take the whole top half of the map or whatever, you know, and, and it's fine. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it does vary a lot. And maybe it varies too much and like it should be a little bit more grounded or something. But I think as it currently stands, it's, it seems functional, uh, but we'll see how things go. Right. Like some people think that it's too, like the blind was saying, it's like super unsafe because of the drops. But I feel like that's assuming that you can actually kill somebody with drops, which isn't always possible. Like a lot of the times you do some superficial damage, but like then you open yourself up to a counter attack because you dedicated so much military to the drop and now you've got nothing at home. That happens all the time to turn yeah, players. Yeah. So kind of interesting you and, don't want you know. to play everything on one card yeah well i mean the other thing too is that i, I casted a game a set that went up yesterday uh Nibline versus the shambler on high water is specifically and he did a lot of drops in one of the games but he flew over like three units <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah and it's yeah, like he, and then he comments this hurts my soul i had no idea <laughs> it's like bro he, he moved <laughs> over three different units that you could have scouted that's three so that's stuff like that it's like all right man <laughs> you know but yeah, I don't know. It's it's definitely interesting. I think um, you know we've we've obviously had a big focus on the competitive side of things with the maps and the tournaments and all this other stuff. But I do think that you know it's it's on the list of the run of show here. I do think we'll be taking a break going into January. I, I don't think that we'll be continuing the same um, focus on competitiveness. Like we probably won't have a tournament on January. Uh, we might not even have a tournament in February, but like, we'll see how it goes. Uh, maybe if we do have a tournament on either of those months, it might be like a one day, like free for all tournament or something where it's like, or something really non-standard where it's like just, uh, a one day run or something, uh, exhibition tournament, maybe like invite certain players in or something. Uh, but you know, like there's that, that's a thing. The other thing though, is that like, I really want to make more single player content. I really want to make more yeah. like, you know, voice acting for the units and stuff. I did a little bit of unit response work in uh, pre-release. We got the Vagrant and the Anseal, uh, at least the Anseal's placeholder. I think the Vagrant will end up being fine. Um, but the, uh, the Anseal is just like waiting for somebody else, uh, some other person's voice to, to, to do the lines. I sent it to Lowler Skates for now. We'll see how soon he uh, gets back to me on that. But like, you know, just having more unit responses basically for the game is going to be a nice touch. And then more, obviously having more, um, fronts for the uh like the the single player experience so that players who want to be competitive but don't really know where to start actually have a starting point instead yeah, of i was being, i uh, was skeptical about the dracadin but it, it looks so good yeah. in, in the game yeah well and it, it needs it some just... work on the death animation in particular and i think like the player color mask is like a little noisy when it animates so that's something that we have to figure out but oh actually the dev animation felt like it, it looked uh amazing compared to the previous one but maybe there's like some some details i didn't see uh it probably needs like an actual explosion instead of it just being like a the blood is is very awkward because of like the way that it just the way that it's like not transparent so it has like these weird dark edges and stuff um, oh, yeah, and then I like see. the blood itself needs to be a bit brightened so like bailiff is aware of the issues and he's working on working to fix them so that's going to be fine uh solstice contributed a little bit with some tweaks to the uh uh i think it was just the materials and he like configured the render a little bit differently but yeah so it, that's going to be really cool too to have that and nobody will complain that it's called a dracodin instead of a dragoon now it's uh it's beautiful yeah. it's got a new new sprite and honestly when it first started t actually turning people's brains broke bro <laughs> like they had no idea yeah. they're like what it actually turns and it shoots and everything so yeah it's, it's you, need a, you need a cast scene when they're when they're like uh like you have a group of dracodins that move down and then they turn and and that's like your epic casting when they fight someone <laughs> yeah the the, and... the climax of the music like the <laughs> like the hype video style <laughs> and it's just yeah. like they they they're moving downward and then it turns and then like zooms in and you hear all this fucking hype music and filters go on yeah. the screen <laughs> that would be good 
yeah insane shit yeah because yeah, the hype videos were neat oh yeah yeah what did you think of that like i, I think i you may have mess- messaged me about it but it's been it's, yeah it's i told amazing. you i, w- I re them multiple times because oh, they were pretty hype there you go yeah and yeah. especially Chandler one for some reason yeah he picked good music for that well that's the thing is you, people got to qualify so they get a hype video you know what i mean that's what i hope hope I to uh instill in people you know like as soon as it depends saw his Yoda cock and ball torture song in the in the game. He was like, "Holy shit! I have to qualify to the next one so I can pick that again, or or whatever other demented thoughts go on." Dude, that actually gave me an idea. Imagine when you have victory screen. Yeah, it actually plays the music. Yeah, that would be it, really like cool. In, like on in the, the broad- game. It, well, in the game would be better because then I don't have to wrangle shit in the broadcast. But like you know, you know when it like plays the bloop sound and stuff. Um, when you join a lobby, I wanted that to be configurable yeah. as well. Like I wanted you to be able to configure like a different sound from the game and uh, somehow play that for other players. Like, I don't know how you would sync that. I see. It's like, that's something that I want for sure. The victory thing, the anthem or whatever is what I want uh, as well. So yeah, that, that would be really awesome if you got to basically play like an excerpt from the, like basically whatever that 30 second excerpt is from the, uh, or maybe that would be in the score screen or something. I don't really know. But like something to to have it basically be like, you know, here's here's the theme that you chose for your hype mu- background music. And like, yeah, that plays when mm. you win. Like that would be really cool. I don't know how, where it would come into play, but that would be really cool. So yeah, it would be great. Yeah. Technically implementing it. I don't know. But great idea for sure. So yeah, I think stuff like that would be really epic. Um Maybe I'll just set up some some scenes or whatever in OBS to at least play it on the broadcast. But like having the player hear it, having both players hear it, like that's you psychologically traumatize your opponent by playing Yoda Cock and Ball Torture when you win. Like that's <laughs> that's pretty bad, man. So yeah, I don't know. I, I want all sorts of cool stuff like that. This is where it's like it's kind of stupid that it, that feels like new engine territory is required for it for like more complex like setup like that, but. You know, I almost feel like it might be a better thing <laughs> in an Thera context or whatever. Um, however, I will say that in general, the game the game's going in a pretty interesting place. And I think that being able to focus more on, like, bringing up audiovisuals, bringing up unit responses, bringing up, um, you know, single-player content and stuff, being able to focus on that in the first month or two of the year... I think will work out really, really well. Like we'll we'll get to Ascension Q7 as as aforementioned, but yeah. uh, and then we'll close the year out on a high. And I think that and then we'll have the holidays, and then we'll have the the new year that we can focus on, you know, other stuff that's kind of gone by the wayside. Where you know we I haven't done any roster profile videos in a while, even like some more marketing stuff could definitely make a make a you know an appearance. Honestly, it would be really cool to have, like, now that we've had so many games, I can actually, like, pick, like, a spot where a unit's ability was used or something and say, like, you can see it was used in this particular game, like, in this replay yeah. or whatever, you know, in this uh, professional match or CMW, yeah. shit like mm-hmm. that. It's like... It reminds me of when we were discussing, like, build orders. Uh, oh, yeah. Automatically exported to people for, like, practicing or whatever. Of, like, oh, Shambler did this build or whatever. Yeah, in Ascension 7, Veek 7 won the tournament by doing that. Yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Listen, it's a it's a possibility is all I'm going to say. Yeah, well, maybe, but I don't think I can win with Mist yet. <laughs> and Hapsaya is getting better, so I was probably... Honestly, like, it sounds weird to say because he's not... He hasn't played a single recorded match of, like, competitive, like, in a tournament environment, but I honestly think Upsaya could just win the whole thing because he's that skilled. So it's a question of does he get familiar enough and does he get blindsided by cheese by people enough? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's going to be interesting. I think um, in the future, one of the things that I might do, going back to the qualifier thing briefly, is... You know, we might end up seeing like, oh, you need to make it to top six to get an invite back. So if you get eliminated in the first round, you don't get an invite back and you have to go back to the qualifier. Like we might make it more and more exclusive as time goes on. Um, the other thing, too, that uh, Mesk brought up yesterday was that, you know, people want to play in these tournaments, but they are getting more exclusive as the player skill rises. And they're kind of like the only things that we run right now because we didn't really do fraud nights uh, as much, right? Fraud archies. Um, yeah. and stuff like that so that's another thing that we'll try to to bring back in january but yeah i don't know it's it's interesting right it's cool to see and it's cool to see that kind of thing like i definitely want uh, it's you know it's frightening to try to pick up ai bug because right. i was in kind of sorry state lately 
Yeah, I mean, I've improved some things on the script level, but definitely, um, you know, people, there was that brief conversation of potentially porting Kairos over, and it's like, you know, if we if we could somehow do that in Brood War, then we would have so much better, like, precise control over things. We probably could make them, like, do the build orders from tournament matches and stuff uh, later down the line. But yeah, mm. like, even if it's a low sc- scope improvement, like, low-hanging fruit or whatever, like, fixing them, floating their fucking buildings... Uh, as Terran and like not landing them properly. Uh, stuff like that would just be, you know, if you find these like edge cases that totally break certain aspects of the AI and you fix them, then you're bringing up the floor of their performance and that definitely improves things. Yeah. So I think yeah. maybe thinking about it in those terms can make it less daunting. Um, but, you know, I don't know. I have a very different perspective on some of that stuff than I used to where like I used to agree like it was super daunting to do all this shit. And, and now it's more like, I don't know, like, I, I just, it's like, okay, yeah, it's going to be daunting to, like, learn Pagan level design or, like, Doom level design or whatever, but I just start doing it. It's like, you know, um, somehow I've, uh, you know, brain-fucked myself into thinking that, like, <laughs> well, as long as I just keep doing this thing, it will happen. <laughs> so uh, that, maybe it's also, like, a habit. Like, I've talked about this before, too, is, like, I wake up and, like, besides, like, maybe checking my phone for notifications about, like, you know, people might ping me with an issue in CMW or like they might, uh, I, I read the chat log of like, I re- actually, I read the chat log of you playing upside and stuff like that, uh, this morning when I woke up and it's like, all right, I do that. Like the morning sort of, you know, brush my teeth, all this other stuff. But then I sit down, and I work like the first thing I think about pretty much when I wake up is like, man, I really want to do X thing or like, you know, so I'm highly motivated. Especially I, I've heard you're especially productive before you eat. Well, uh, yeah, that's probably true for me geez. because I don't eat until I, I, I haven't even eaten yet today. And uh, so I won't eat it for another like hour. And then, uh, you know, that'll be like before the, yeah. the cast. So Maybe yeah, that's a super trick that you didn't realize. Yeah, it could be. I mean, I'm pretty productive after that, too. But by that point, the momentum's already in there, right? Because you already started a bunch of stuff. Right. So that could, yeah. be, that could be it. That could be it. I mean, obviously, you've got a very different circumstance because you're working a full time job and you got like other obligations anyway on top of that from family and stuff. So. For me, it's like I have the family obligations. I have a part-time job. Like that frees up a lot more hours to be Smash. So. Yeah, kind of wish I I had a like a American job or whatever because that would actually convert to a lot of zloty. Yeah, a lot of threes, bro. like you like to say, zloty. Yeah. So yeah, I guess that comes to uh, <clears throat> comes to a close on that topic. I was going to talk a bit about uh, things that I've learned about pagan. Uh, since you're here and you were actually on the stream, uh, you may or may not have noticed the more non-linear level design that I was going for. Do you have, yeah, since I you're here, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, a question. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And the question that I posted, I think, is, oh, I was asking you what, what would be the, like, the goal of the player. I wasn't sure, like, uh, about, like, the story ramifications of what's happening, mm. like, yeah, yeah, or, like, what what is the incentive for the player other than just oh shoot enemies? <laughs> yeah, like, is there yeah. some some goal to explore? Is it, is there something? Yeah, I think uh, the idea would be to, to do? related to like reclaiming lost um, pieces of your spirit and and that sort of thing. That's sort of like the the premise of mm. the game uh, is to get back to your full power and remake the uh, the the universe in in a way that isn't so desolate uh, because the when you when you appear things are really bad there's like all these warring factions and they're all basically like it, they've all degenerated into some kind of like ridiculous infighting or or whatever uh there's like hellish you know demonic spirits and then there's the the zombies and their masters and then there's the uh like the people who have just decided well we're uh you know powerful and, and wealthy and influential enough that we will just leave the planet to its own making instead of actually helping. And so we're just going to fly off into space. Yeah. So you get like these different factions basically at play and you know, you've got to fight all of them in, in various ways. And there's probably going to be even more than the three there, but th- those are the three that I've come up with for now. So, you know, when you first start, you're dealing with the zombies, uh, which are just using like the default free doom asset for the imp. And uh, they chase after you, and they're pretty aggro. I haven't done data entry for yeah, the other yeah. enemies yet, but the uh, the thought leaders are going to have a ranged attack with some kind of weapon, and they're also going to, when they're present, the idea is that they focus the zombie enemies a little bit more. Uh, so they like pick mm-hmm. a target, and then the or like an area or whatever, and then the zombies all flock to that. So in FFA context, the thought leader might like focus the zombies onto like a high value enemy target, which could be you, or it could be like you know I don't know like a, a souped up you know demonic ent- entity from one of the other cases or whatever. 
So, yeah, it's cool to. It will be very cool to see FFA's because that means you're. There's more depth to gameplay where you can like try to strategize with uh, yeah. how you want to battle and how you want to like switch your focus and how you want to like maybe sneak in or, or something and yeah it's it's cool for gameplay stuff and it's also cool for just like immersion yeah to see the world actually existing outside of you I can agree with that and uh, yeah as far as the level design stuff too it's just I'm figuring out what it means to make like a non-linear level that actually functions. And so far I've got a couple of paths here and there, but like I am a little worried that it's just going to explosively branch out, uh, you know, because yeah, the combinatorial thing is going to happen, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, the non-linear thing is weird when you have to like backtrace and mm -hmm. so basically... Well, that's where the it being a dynamic world comes to mind, where it's like, I, I wouldn't want enemies to just like infinitely respawn or whatever, but if there's like, oh, you killed, you cleared this area, so then like this patrol path that comes it through anyway is going to see that and raise an alarm or something, you know, and then more people will show up, you know, and stuff like that could be the case. Yeah, yeah that, it could be interesting. So I, I, I'm i seeing, I guess, two approaches that you could take, and one is uh, basically where you can go from everywhere, anywhere to everywhere. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then backtracing wouldn't be as much of a problem because you could just like go in circles or whatever and you would still be able to explore stuff. And the other thing uh, that you just gave me an idea for is like if you have like multiple paths and at the end of each path there's like some significant event that happens. Maybe you're beating like a boss or like uh, do, uh, getting the, the, the part of your spirit bag mm -hmm. or whatever and then the, the world changes and reflects that action somehow and then going back to the places you were actually significantly modifies them yeah. in some way. Well, I think there's definitely going to be a little bit of both options but specifically on the second one I wanted one dynamic event or whatever to be that you actually let in another faction you can choose to. So if you go to like the terminating point of a specific path then maybe you like allow you, you like you, you breach or allow the breach of this facility and then like you know the demonic faction shows up and starts to like wreak havoc on it and and see what they can do and so like you you kind of have to dip set immediately you gotta you gotta fall back because there's like gonna be a lot of it's, it's like a full-scale invasion right so that you've got to fall mm -hmm. away because you probably aren't going to be able to deal with that many units but um that means that that's going to like summon a, a more immediate response from the 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 epithet which is the faction with the zombies and stuff so it's like okay you know, that's like one thing that you can do. And that will absolutely have changes on the world because then maybe they're coming in from other entrances too now that they've breached the primary one. Uh, and, you know, that obviously is going to kick the epithet into higher alert status. And now they're going to try to respond to that. So, yeah, it feels like they go from responding to like one intruder, one infiltrator in you to like, a, you know, suddenly an invasion from the arrival faction. Mm. Like they're going to have they're going to have severely kicked up the uh, the notch as far as that goes. And, you know, maybe some some more pathways open up as well, like uh, a door that might have been locked previously or, or open previously. Is there like, like a, is there like an allied faction in Delore? Uh, like the one that's allied to you? Or I didn't you plan on one because the whole idea was that you're you're not satisfied with any of them and uh they all need to be cleansed basically so that was the that's sort of like playing into the trope of like you being a, a super soldier but like solo in some ways uh i know you that see. that doesn't happen in all of the games that or, or all of the mods or whatever from from gz doom but it, for me it's i th i think that's attractive personally now i do like the idea mm -hmm. of you, you 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 brought up like what if you could like you know commandeer automatons or or like manufacture them for for your Maybe. own fighting or something like what could be interesting too is like if you could somehow like take part of your spirit split it or whatever when like when you're actually more recovered if you could divide it or whatever and like split yourself to multiple beings or whatever to have like assistance mm -hmm. basically like yeah, ai controlled good. minions or whatever that Maybe maybe you have, like, weapons, then you could, like, make that weapon fight on its own or something. Yeah, I think that would definitely know. be an interesting power to imagine, is, like, you basically deploying something akin to a turret or whatever uh, that, like, inherits the weapon that you had in in your hand at that point. Or maybe, like, as the, the weapon literally fires a projectile that, like, sticks to the wall or floor or ceiling, 
and like shoot stuff that's within its range or something like that. So like, it would actually be because in lore, all of your bullets, your your ammo is your spirit as well. It's your spirit energy. So like that's your mm. weapons. You don't pick up weapons dropped by enemies in this game. All of the weapons are like godlike relics and stuff like these elevated aspects that, uh, you, you know, mere mortals would not even be able to wield because they don't actually have the spirit energy to do so. Right? I guess so, the idea is that those weapons will cleanse the en- like cleanse the enemies instead mm-hmm. of killing them. Um. Well, it doesn't really matter one way or the other. But yeah, like the from a, a thematic standpoint, you could think of it as you're using your energy to uh, unmake them. Uh, you know, considering you are the maker. I know you you thought maker was a really epic action verb. Uh, one of the few epic action verbs out there. And yeah, now, I now I use it. So you must be happy. The unmaker. <laughs> <laughs> the you maker. That's me. You maker. Free maker. That's you. And that's actually you. Whoa. I mean, that's the that's our audience. Our audience is the three makers because they give us threes. Yeah. They make the threes and then they the give us the perfect moment to to answer coffee question that is true yeah it's a great great segue so yeah for those unaware uh pronogo and vk7 is a word that you can type with no spaces with a zero instead of an o remember pronogo has got a zero for the first first o anyway you can click the link in the description it's easier that way and that'll take you seven. to our coffee page and uh, yeah it, all, it does have a seven as well so uh basically we just accept donations so if you want to donate towards project development you can give back you can give us threes and we do appreciate it one time or subscription whatever you want it it all goes to project development we do not have a strippers and coke fund unlike blizzard so you can uh (laughs) you can rest assured we'll be using it for good things like coffee uh funnily enough so uh, our first question is from mirian and he asks how do you plan on tackling co-op content in the future so vicky may remember from the last episode mirian asked about uh, in the near and far future. And I answered the near one. And then I was like, well, maybe you ask that question again, but with just the future, uh, since I, I referenced like Acropolis, I referenced the scenarios I already have. Uh, one of the things I referenced is actually those, uh, old back in Hydra days when Hydra was still going to be a remake of the original campaign before it was rebranded to Cosmonarchy Brood War. The cool thing about the, um, the, yeah, the, the, the cool thing overall about the, the campaign idea was that it's co-optional. And so I had all of these maps that were refurbished campaign maps or remade from scratch most often. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, here's here's some content for you guys. Like you can play this in single player or you can get a buddy in and maybe more than one buddy, depending if it's like a like the first map, I think, was three player technically. So uh, and that yeah, was for, because you had AI ally and the co-optional player. Yeah. So uh, that was that's definitely something I still believe in pretty strongly, but it's like. Obviously, I'm not going to remake somebody else's work in in that way. Uh, it's just better to make my own. Uh, but yeah, the idea of like if you have an AI ally, you can play, uh, you can put a human in that slot. I think that's really cool. So ideally, we would have some capacity for that. But uh, the other thing too is that, um, I mean, since then there's been a lot of developments. Uh, as far as like the kinds of co-op content that I want in the future, I do think something like Acropolis would be pretty cool. I mean, anything that's like a you can kind of call it more arcade style, but I just mean like replayable where the idea is that it could fit, uh, it could adapt fo- to many different cases where, you know, maybe depending on the map you choose, you've got a smaller number of spawns. Like it might be two spawn or three spawn for the players. Uh, but the idea is that like in the future, I mean, we're, we're thinking in the context of maybe having, you know, our own engine up and running and all this other stuff. Well, the player limit isn't a problem anymore. So now, like, you can adapt the diff. You know, you can actually have players decide, I want to fight against 10 players instead of, you know, four or whatever. <laughs> and so, like, in theory, they could, like, customize the experience a bit and it would be a bit more on the arcade style, uh, insofar as it's replayable and it's, um, it, it, you know, everybody's, you, you could set their races, you could set their personalities, whatever for the, for the enemies. Uh, I feel like something like that could be really cool. Um, generally, just co op content where it's, playing it in a non-standard way. I mean, there would be like a more standard experience if you just played, you know, two versus two AI on the melee maps, then you're kind of having a co-op experience. But I was thinking of something where it's like, what if StarCraft II co-op wasn't utterly terrible and devoid of any sort of inspiration whatsoever? Uh, what if it wasn't just such corporate slop that it may put you to sleep every time you played it? Like, that's sort of what I'm thinking of. Is like, you got these scenarios for the map specifically where you have to do certain things. Uh, oftentimes, it's just survive the onslaught of, like, a bigger enemy, but maybe it could be more straightforward. 
and it's replayable to the degree that you can customize that experience if you want. And there are certain things that are always going to be different because not really, there's even if you have the same player count, same map and same race count uh, and all that, you're probably not gonna get the same experience because like the build orders could be different or like the units user could be different and all this, all that other stuff. So I guess you I could say that. I think tried it in Strike After it. Just the problem is it felt very fake because it was always like the same intervals happen the same things and yeah. they have spawned waves so yeah. like okay you face different races different compositions but it's like all spawned and it's just fake you can't cripple them you can't like you can't destroy the bases i think to like take an expansion which is like retarded that to expand you have to like you have to kill your enemy's uh, base and then they still spawn the yeah. waves anyway right? they instantly have all map control like i feel like it would be fine to have them have some map control because they were already established mm -hmm. in the area and you're yeah. you're coming in with like trying to assault them for whatever reason. So I think that can make sense. Well sometimes you're the ones defending too. <laughs> A lot of the times you're defending something that happens as opposed to assaulting. Uh yeah. I so, so like I don't remember all the missions. I know there's a scenario where you're having to like evacuate colonists or whatever and it's taken from one of the Wings of Liberty mission concepts. And it's like you're clearly here as part of a defense force, but they have all the map control. Yeah. <laughs> so it, yeah. doesn't, it just doesn't so, work. You know, it doesn't work at all. So, yeah. yeah that's dumb. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it has to be anything too grand either. Like, I think it can be like a glorified melee map or whatever, but it's just made in a, you know, asymmetric fashion. Um, but just like you could do something more grand. You could do something where it's like, you know, this crazy FFA and you're like caught in the middle. That's sort of like the, the premise of Acropolis with some other uh, arcadey elements, I guess. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Oh, I rem remembered one mission that's very uh, stupid. It's the Zelnaga Temple one from Legacy of the Void. And they had it for Cup too. That was terrible. That's sad. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, why would they make a new map when they could just reuse community ones or their own ones? So. I still I yeah. still thought it was really funny that somebody recorded a voice line that said my name in it because I was contributing to the the map that eventually got made into a actual map and then they were like we can't use this Proto goes a fucking yeah, this asshole he hates us <laughs> so, I don't know it's pretty good yeah as in game files right yeah yeah so I mean yeah. maybe it was never actually meant to be used as just an Easter egg, but that feels oddly specific. It feels like they were gonna use that and then like some lawyer looked at it and was like, what the fuck? <laughs> so yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I think co-op content, like the other thing that I would like to ask people as well about co-op content is like what to some degree, most people have never played good co-op content from an RTS because like it's Red Alert 3 and StarCraft 2. Like those are your options. So it's all terrible. But I guess I would ask like what are you guys looking for out of a co-op specific scenario that you wouldn't get out of playing Melee 2v2 AI or whatever? Like, you know, what's the player count you're looking for? Like, how many of your homies do you want to support? Uh, what kind of thing are you looking for as far as, like, length of the game? Like, do you want to play, like, a short 20-minute 20, 20 minute game, rather? Or do you want to play, like, you know, for an hour? Like, do you want it to be variable? Like, these sorts of questions, right? And, like, I, that's I the kind like of thing the that I The big thing ask. with the co-op missions is that you have... Uh, you implicitly have asymmetry mm -hmm. and you don't get that in mini games. Yep. And you often also have a mission and like an and objective it, aside from just, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That reminds me of, uh, I mean, actually not, not what I meant. Uh, not, not just, uh, like a special objective. What, what I meant is like, you have a in story yeah. reason yeah. to an in universe like, excuse to do. Yeah, what yeah, you're yeah. Doing. Yeah. And it reminds me of the, the key on missions that he once did. And he was playing that with, uh Folka, I think. Yeah. Uh it was like the Taiwan versus Zerg map and it was really hard at the time. Uh at least for them I think. Uh and I, I no, I think I think we were all defeated by it very often. So Yeah, it was a hard mission from what I remember. So Yeah. So uh, that that's sort of what reminds me when we are thinking co op. Yeah, and, and it makes sense because when you think about it from the perspective of like what people are looking for, I would definitely say that like the if you're playing co-op, that's probably true, right? It's probably like, you know, that's um, I don't know. I just it feels right to have a situation like that to have that kind of content in the game. So I guess that's what I would say. And overall, I would like to see 
that kind of content make it out there. And in the far future or the you know mid future or whatever, you know, beyond CMBW basically is what we're looking at here. I do think that the co-op content should try to elevate that. It should still test your RTS skills, but it should be asymmetric. There should be some sort of, you know, plausible story design there. And, you know, I I would like stuff that's more replayable, but I also think it's fine to have a campaign that happens to be co-opable. Um, it's just a question of like, when you're thinking of it from a, the perspective of a campaign, then you're limiting your scope naturally to be like, okay, it's going to be two players or three players or whatever. Like, you're probably not going to have more than that. And if you're going to have more than that, you know, it really constrains the kinds of missions you can make. Even three players is a lot, not just in the CMBW context, because there's so few other players, but like the map size, the fact that like, even if you didn't have a map size limit, there's still a limit on how, what you can well, reasonably if you have do. three players, yeah. that basically means you, you're limited to like grand, yeah. uh, grand battles, yeah. design wise. And... At least generally that's, speaking. Like, you could do short skirmishes, but those missions are going to be done pretty quickly, right? Yeah, that's one thing. But the other thing is, like, lore-wise, it doesn't really make sense to, like, deploy three different factions yeah, just to, yeah. like, do something small. So that's right. It makes sense to for it to be a grand conflict. And that's not all campaigns. Uh, that is a very specific subset. So you can, you're basically That's like, creatively yeah. limited yeah. when you're doing co And you can uh, choose to take your campaign in that direction eventually. There can be a ramp up. But like the only way, like your starting position is some is like not, it's like the mid or end point of like a conventional single player campaign. It's like getting to the point where I have, you know, three plus players on one team. Uh, like three plus commanders being deployed. It's like that's a lot of of army when you think about like each player having maybe a thousand, two thousand units or something in the in the end game. It's like if that if that kind of thing can happen, it's it's absolutely going to be a lot more grand scale. So you're right there, um, and it doesn't mean that it's I, I would avoid doing it, but it means like you have to ramp up to something higher than that if you want a curve. And I think you do want a curve because if it's kind of the same the whole way through from the first mission to the last, then you didn't really feel like you did anything on a visceral level, right? So you do want to get to a point where like the first mission is to the last mission, the same thing that going from one player in a single player campaign to like having six AI allies and fighting 12 other enemies is like the last mission. It's like you'd basically want to be in that position as a... Uh, in the three-player campaign too, it's like okay, we start off with three players, and then we we end like facing eighteen different enemies, and we have like six AI allies and stuff. And it's like, well, that's a pretty big jump. Like you got to curve up there, uh, and that also means that like generally those missions take longer to make because you got more moving parts, you got bigger maps, you got you know more bases, more terrain to detail, more um, characters involved, so the scripts get bigger, all this other stuff, right? So that. Not to say that it's impossible. I'll probably be doing that at some point. Like you check back in a year or so. <laughs> That'll probably be something that I'm interested in, in jumping into. But that's the kind of thing that does require you to do a lot more. Uh, and in CMBW specifically, we can't realistically make like a three-player campaign that goes on for too long because we, there's a, a much lower limit of how many players we can have. So it's not like we can do that like, you know, nine versus 18 that we were talking about there, there hypothetically. That's not possible in Brood Wars. So yeah, I don't know. It's it, it definitely something that I want to do though. I want to get to the point where we can have stuff like that. But I, I would say that like in general for the people who are listening to this, who are interested in co-op stuff, think about like how many players you'd be liking to have. Is it just going to be two player or is it going to be like three or more? Um, do you want it to be replayable or a one-time thing? Do you want it to be like 20 minutes or an hour or longer? Like w w some data on like what you guys are actually looking for would definitely help it, at least in the short term, me figure out what might be a good way to, you know, encourage more people to play because when you have a, the word of mouth, but it's not just like a trusted source, it's like, I'm going to play this with you. Dude, I want to play this with you. That obviously converts a lot more people. So I think from a, uh, I guess a marketing standpoint or whatever, an outreach standpoint, co-op content can be really, really compelling. Uh, particularly since not everybody's interested in the competitive side, but the mod has a lot that can appeal to people from And a, one thing uh, I was thinking side. for uh, just a single player campaign mm -hmm. is that you could potentially... Uh, allow to Arkham mode any mission. Yeah, that's fair. I don't know exactly how we would do so, it in Brood War, but yeah, like in, in a, and the more far future stuff, like absolutely you could have yeah, a, yeah. a team, like shared control basically, you know, so. There's yeah, basically. Although you would want to be very uh, conscious that you wouldn't want to make a circuit of two mission. Uh, I mean, you always have to be conscious yes. of that, but basically, uh, 
And starting after you can't expand, and the scale is very low, and like you're very limited on resources. Basically, losing units matters a lot more than actually playing uh, the RTS mm. does. So like uh, the macro is almost non-existent, yeah. and you can easily overbuild workers and stuff. And I, I feel like that kind of gameplay would be really annoying to uh, play. Uh, in arco mode basically so, well yeah i had uh, a i had a very like quick and dirty implementation of shared control in uh my brother's birthday most recently and we literally just played like random maps or whatever in cmbw but we had shared control and it was with like you know a bun it was like an ai ffa with the two of us and it was pretty hard like it was pretty eclectic uh, and it was cool to see that like I can like send him units basically. Like I was the macro player and he was the micro player, right? Because he doesn't do yeah. That's games usually the the yeah. best split because uh, if you both try to macro and micro, uh, you can you often... can confuse each other at the point. And the really yeah. cool thing about it that I don't think has ever actually been tried because no RTSs have fucking scale is what if you had an, uh, a shared control and you get to the point where each player has like three bases because you have six bases total. It's like now I can run yeah. my side of the map and I can send shit your way and you can grab them when they're there and like that's way more interesting to me than like yeah. oh let me share control and fight like two zerglings or whatever the fuck it's like that's yeah. so boring so yeah I, I think that that's like and you can get there organically starting off with just the default i mean like maybe maybe it would be good to start off with like uh you know like if you're terran you've got a ministry six masons and you also have like a stockade and a maverick and then like the maverick can be the scout so at least you have something to do you know when I played 2v2 games in StarCraft 2 with weaker players, uh, I'd usually want the control just so I can, like, open the depot to expand as one thing. Mm. But often I found myself, like, correcting their mistakes yeah. and, and even wanting to, like, spend money for them because I knew they were floating and oh, I had okay. enough APM to do so. Yeah. But I couldn't because the game blocks that. <laughs> so... Yeah, uh, I mean, also, it's kind of lame when you have to rely on that or when that's, like, a thing. Yeah, that's so, true. You know, that's why, but, like, we don't have shared, like, resource sharing or whatever. You can't, like, send your ally resources or whatever. But, like, in a, in a shared yeah, control yeah. sense, I think it's really cool. I mean, you wouldn't have the unique banks at that point. So, like, if you have six bases and you're both trying to spend your money. But, like, if you have enough income, then it probably doesn't matter that much. And you can communicate that. You can be like, hey, I'm saving for tier three. Or, it would be or, pretty know. annoying if your ally would be queuing five units per building. <laughs> yeah, you'd have to make sure that they didn't. Dude, I was so surprised to see Artosis do, do it so much. <laughs> Although he was playing Protoss, so maybe maybe that's just a meme because he was like, <laughs> oh, I can I can win the game with one hand by recalling. Yeah, I liked that video a lot. And he's like, it's too hard, guys. It's so it's hard as great. <laughs> Yeah, dude, I, I really want him to just see like one seventh of the units inside CMBW and just shit his pants on stream. Is that yeah? That'd be pretty good. All right, yeah. So I think that uh, pretty much covers the the topic. I do think that you're right about the share control stuff, and I and thinking about it on a larger scale would be really cool. So yeah, maybe we'll uh, find some way to implement that in a short term case. But at least Miria knows what we're planning in the long term. And if you wanted to answer that question that I posed about like the data that you're looking for for your co op stuff, obviously post it in the comments. Talk about it on Discord, whatever you want. And that takes us to Three Crows' question. He asks, what kind of symbiotic or parasitic relationships could arise between Zabalba regencies? And he gives a very long example. This is the longest question that he's ever asked. So he's, he says, for example, the Macrolon rely on Dasir to do their work. What if this kind of relationship was taken a step further where one regency manipulates another for its own benefit while trying, to, or, while trying or not trying to preserve the base species slash construct? And he goes on a little bit more detail, obviously, because it's much longer than that. Talking about like the example of the Roselium the being hacked or whatever. I don't know why, but it makes me think of Colipazes just being parasitic on everyone. <laughs> yeah, I mean they 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 uh they're mind parasites in a way because they like harvest the fear. But he said Colipazes has been discussed a lot, so bonus points if you can cover some other regions things. And last time somebody said bonus points and I did it, I got that bonus coffee money. Let's go. Oh. So you know, I, I don't know if if I'm gonna hold three credit to the same standard, but just saying that's already if you if you say bonus points, you're putting a bounty on answering that part of the question. So FYI. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know. I still have to host that a kiss trickor bounty. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, if you're a Zerg player in the tournament and you build a kiss trickor and actually use them to infest stuff, and it's not like an open and shut stupid game where you already won and you're like keen taking an hour to explore the tech tree, then yeah, I think Veek will uh, send you some money. So FYI, probably yeah. So we'll see. We'll see. But uh, I will say, however, that uh, as far as the answer to this question goes. I mean, that's funny because the Acoustic Core is very clearly a, like a symbiotic parasitic relationship. <laughs> it's funny, uh, yep. you know, coincidence there. Um, yeah, so Balbus, uh setting has like a lot of potential options for that. Uh, I definitely think that the example of like the Roselium being uh, led like sort of like Pied Piper style where they're sort of led down a path that they think is the way that they need to go, but they're kind of like mistaken. That could definitely happen. Uh, the Solar Throne is a Regency that does a lot of misdirection and a lot of ways to like psychologically or in a mor- like a morally sense, like um, the mor- a morale sense, I should say, they break their uh, uh, their opponents, their opposition. And that to me is like really thematic for them. So I look at that and I think to myself like, they would definitely be a, a, a big force for that. Uh, but even beyond that, it's also like, mm, like anything to do with sort of mind control, which the Macrolon have some of. Um, you could maybe think of Gatamemter as like one giant symbiote, but I don't know. Like it really depends on what you how you how you break that one down. Uh, they definitely like take over things, right? They become things. Things become it. So it's a, a bit weird. Uh, a bit non-standard and uh the orlothrae are like you know they're not actually like mycelium or mushrooms or whatever or spores but they're kind of like that like it's one way to think about them and as a result they uh clearly take over things and and subsume them and that's where their control comes from so you have those like that mechanistic things right the escozi also have like really heavy gene manipulation for that sort of process uh so that's another thing that they can do but um, when it comes to like taking over like a faction of a regency or like, you know, leading them in that way, you're definitely thinking more biological and less technological. Um, I mean, the rune get destroyed by this all the time where they're basically like, they're kind of low IQ. Okay. Like they're kind of stupid. So they're very one note fixated on things, but through their sheer numbers and their like instinctual, understanding of how to shape metal uh because they these things were like genetically engineered basically so they can't actually articulate how they know certain things they just know it sort of like uh, how birds know how to migrate like they don't really think about it as far as we know they just do it so it's kind of like that for them uh so they're able to create weapons of war and they're able to like spread far and wide across the galaxies but they are also able to it's, it's you know emergent behavior yeah yeah that's exactly how ant colonies work yeah exactly yeah so there's definitely something like that for them. And the rune also are like, they're in that weird kind of state where, because they're so, they're not very sophisticated and they go after like luxury and they go after like the shiniest object, basically they can be led astray all the time. Uh, but the problem is they're not very loyal. So even if you're like, Hey, I've got more stuff for you to loot and plunder later on at some point, they're just going to be like, what if we loot and plundered you though? What if you actually? And so they just do that to you. So it's not a very stable situation. <laughs> yeah. It's not a very stable situation for them. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, I guess looking at it from that standpoint, it's uh, it's pretty interesting to think of it from those terms. Like to me, I just think of it like there's manipulation, there's social engineering. Uh, Colopoazos do do that because they like, they basically like whisper in the ear of people from afar. Sometimes they're very capricious, uh, you know, entities. Um, but you know, like just like the devil. Yeah, just like the devil. He's on your shoulder. Follow you, you're the chosen one, and then he just convince you to do something real stupid, like play StarCraft too. Got him! Got yeah. him! Upsia! Fucking got him! All right. No, he, it's just because he kind of looks like Jesus if he wears his hair down. Sort of like me. But uh, I will say, though, that when you look at the way that the factions are laid out, like Colopoazos are one, uh, Rune are the the recipient of a lot of that, but it's not like symbiosis in the sense of being hacked or being biologically like taken over. Uh, the Escozi can do it, both on a biological level and on a technological level. I guess the Oros would be capable of manipulating electrical currents. 
that could like in pra I didn't really think about this when I was first making them, but like sometime after I made them, I realized, well, electrical currents, that's kind of like brains, right? So like in theory, if they can manipulate electricity, if they have electrokinesis, would they would some of them be able to like fine tune study that enough to literally like rewire your brain activity or like send synapse signals to your brain or something? So maybe that could be like a really late tier unit for them where that, that there's like some mind control possible there. But again, it's not really like symbiosis in the same sense. So um yeah, that, that's definitely a thing. Obviously, any mind control, Macrolon, Solar Throne, or Lathrae, that kind of stuff can definitely... What, what is this uh, electri electric stuff? That's uh, Oros. The, uh, they're like... They're oh, okay. Not they're, like the Escozi are more uh, like people think mechanized lizards, and now they think of the Escozi. But they're the Escozi are bipedal. The Oros are not. They're quadrupeds. So uh, very, um, they're more animalistic. Well, because them. one thing that makes me you, you said about the brain thing. Uh, yeah, I was wondering. I was thinking, it's technically for like. So, so brains are basically very complex, and yeah. I, I was thinking that if you allowed like a very complex. Uh, like machine learning algorithm, like basically explore the brain, it surely would be able to like learn it eventually. So if you had like super high IQ mm. uh, Oros uh, that would uh, be able to study brains a lot, then I imagine like a high rank one would be able to at least learn something about them. Yeah. Maybe not perfectly, but. Like some sort of manipulation. It could be kind of the... like the aura of control that like mind tyrants have or something where it's like, as long as you're nearby, I can still do it. But this like takes a lot of concentration. I can't do it at range or whatever. Right? Yeah. I assume like some lower rank could like just frenzy you because they would like stimulate yeah. like an emotional response or something. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That could, that could be a real thing. So. Yeah, I don't know. I, I look at that and I think there's a lot of potential for that sort of thing. They, like... Zabalba is really cool because of how many different things it has, but the way that they interact is where the money, that's where the money's made. That's where the rubber meets the road for me is like, oh shit, like these things working in tandem is where we really start to think about some epic stuff. So yeah. Um, thanks for the question three crow. And hopefully you, uh, you appreciated the uh, bonus points for not talking only about Colapazos. <laughs> and that means we're going on to our final question because three the shambler asks if you had to make a puzzle game in one of your settings which would it be and what would be its main mechanics uh i feel like v the last time we did a joint episode didn't this get discussed i feel like we talked about something like a puzzle game i was talking about like exploration and like jumping over stuff and like getting like pursued by enemies that you couldn't like retaliate towards because you were on the run or something i i feel like i have a distinct mm -hmm. memory of talking about something like that with a puzzle game um, but I don't exactly remember what that was. Either way, though, I think, you know, I've had some more time to think about puzzle games in general. I think um, as far as the setting goes, like you could pretty much do any of them. But I think Pangeo would be the most interesting one because it's like such a different setting to anything else. Like everything else is kind of like the the interesting novel things come from the the entities within the universe that create different things where like different constructs or whatever whereas if you look at pangea the world itself the galaxy sized object that you're inside the setting itself is novel it's completely different it's not like default you know laws of physics even so it's like very different so that i think is really cool as like an opportunity for there to be a lot of exploration but i don't know if you have a, a different idea for like puzzle game if anything comes to mind Hmm. Well, puzzle game definitely reminds me of The Witness, but yeah, I haven't played it uh, too much, so uh, I'm not exactly sure what I would make a puzzle game uh, to be. But yeah, uh, yeah, I feel like Zabalba would be a good, a good one because uh, it's just so uh, like vast, yeah, as a setting. So, and then. You could even imagine it being like, um, it being like inside of the mass consciousness uh, race. I don't know uh, what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like inside of them, you would like have some sort of like puzzle thing. It's just like I don't know. It's yeah, and then it like is revealed to you over time or something as you're like you don't even recognize that you are Gadamentor yet, like. That, that could be right. Yeah, I, it could be something where you're like basically uh, learning as the mass consciousness of, of what to do, and then like 
you could be taking perspective of, of like multiple agents, organs, or whatever you would call yeah. uh, the different perspectives of, of the catamanter, and then you would like learn mm. interesting puzzles, and you would solve them, and then maybe you would like use them in battle somehow, I don't know, I mean, it could be something in depth, maybe. Yeah. I mean, it's not exactly sure what it would be, but... Yeah, That's the idea of it. I have this such yeah. a such a tendency towards like action games and stuff that I would definitely want there to be like puzzle and something else. But I also think that if you just focus on puzzle, you can get like more mileage out of that somehow. Like the fact that you're not developing another gameplay system for action and stuff is it's probably better that way. So it's pr like even though I really want to have it be like, oh, what about Total Warfare and stuff in the background? <laughs> it's like, yeah, but what about if we just have the puzzle game, though? Like maybe that's going to be more sane. So but yeah, like as far as main mechanics go, like if we were going to go with your premise, I think it would be. It would be a lot of like reliving the memories of entities that had been integrated into Gatamemter or something like that oh, would be like a, an element there. Um, and maybe, or maybe you would like, you would have this like environment, right? That you walk around in and the more entities you come across and incorporate with, like the more things reveal about the environment when you go back there, because you have memories that like impact the environment or something, you know what I mean? It's like, or memories mm. that reveal details about the environment. Like there's an object that you walk past and it means nothing to you. But then like by living yeah, I mean, through the memory of something else. You have else. this like thing where so you, let's say you listen to something or you talk about something and then you like are looking at, at something specific. Mm -hmm. And then when you like you, you completely forget about that conversation or whatever. And then you look at that thing again after like months or whatever. And then you like exactly remember the conversation. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So th th that's sort of what this reminds me of. Yeah, I, I think that would I would sense. almost think that it's like you walk by a bunch of stuff that maybe has significance, but doesn't really seem like it's that important, or like you don't really look at it again. But then, like when you live through the memories of some other entity, you see that thing again, and if you're paying attention, like maybe you don't even clock it visually, but like then when you go back to that area, you think, "Oh wait, that <laughs> oh, was that the, that was in the that was in the memory." Like I, I remember that, and so. Like that way, it's nonverbal, or it doesn't have to be like pointed. Yeah, out to it would you. be really good because then when you're reliving the memories, then you learn like how all the emergent behaviors of those like puzzles or whatever yeah. work, and then you see something, and then you see actually instead of seeing just like a, an ordinary image or like a, an environmental right. something, you actually see see uh, a puzzle that you can solve, right? Yeah, it, so it's it like the reframing of like what the environment actually is over time, sort of yeah. like the witness with its environmental puzzles, I guess. The other thing i was thinking about though is that maybe you could rem you could specifically choose to explore like not just different endings but like different kinds of things so like the way that you're looking at it might be you've got environments you got areas of the, of the world that you can only access if you remember or ex relive or whatever um memories of like a certain type it's like this character has like their own termination point that you can explore. And it's like the more you learn about that character, the more like they, their memories like impact or like help you understand what's happening around you. Uh, and the same would be true for the other characters. Like there would be multiple, a multitude of, of choices in that respect. And I don't know if they'd be exclusive or if they would just like, you have to, you can like 100% the game in air quotes by like going through all of them. But uh, I was thinking about something like that where like maybe they compete or, or something or it's like and we can maybe have that as an aspect where maybe there's multiple ways to solve a puzzle. And if you solve it with, with like one person's memory uh, or whatever, or like using one person, like the thing that's in one person's experience, then like the other person gets angry or something. I don't know. Like there, there, there could be like different things that go on there where there's like this competition between certain characters. Uh, and maybe that unlocks like a different area of the world, or maybe they do something different at a key point in the narrative or something like there could be different things that you do there. So I, I don't know exactly. That's harder for me to like immediately find a way to unify, but I feel like I'd like to explore that the sort of relationships between characters. Yeah. But yeah, yeah it would be pretty cool. Pretty good stuff. All right. I guess that's, that's it. That seems to be the closing moments. Yeah, we uh, this one was a very long one, and uh, I don't think that I'll be able to bang out one of the uh, casts that I wanted to do before the playoffs at this point, but uh, that just means that there's more for you guys to experience. 
uh, later on in the week. So, of course, that's pretty epic. And thanks, Veek, for sitting down and talking with me about all this stuff. I appreciate that you're uh, able to be more involved these days and you're making maps and you're playing games and giving feedback and impressions. And uh, it does seem like we're getting to the point where, uh, I don't know, we just keep getting closer and closer. I'm very glad I could read Madrigal. Yeah, that's pretty epic. finally sensible. I think so, yeah, I think so. I mean, it wasn't really on my list, to be honest, because it feels like such a... Like, I don't think it can win you games more than, like spending all of the APM and resources on something else can win you games. It doesn't seem like a gimmick that Terran it, like requires. It's just like, if you're a, not good or you don't know that much about it you, and you're not prepared for it, it will, it will win games faster, I guess. But like, I don't know. I, I maybe that's wrong, but I just feel this like visceral desire. Yeah, I, I feel like it was counterplay. It's yeah. just, it, it made the, uh, it made it more volatile because yeah. you could easily lose like entire base of eco. Yeah, and I know some people feel that about the double didact since they cloak each other, but honestly, I feel like you'll probably be able to see signs of that as people figure it out. It's like, oh, they're not attacking me with the multitude of their army. They're just camping their army somewhere, and it's far away from my stuff. Like, hmm, maybe they're going to recall, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, that, that might be like the, the, the initial thing that you worry about, especially if you've scouted Argosy. And then you're like, okay, time to start patrolling and looking around for something. Wait, do they, do they decloak while I... They I'm do, sure but they if decloak. the double didact is there, then they cloak each other. So the idea is that you can't... But they decloak like, when you channel, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there is still like a five-second like time or whatever before they actually initialize it. So you can snipe it, but then they can find... If it's too OP, then just the channel time could go up. Yeah, I think there's, maybe there's an adaptation. Just figure it out. I, yeah, I think so. so. Yeah, I guess with that out of the way, uh, figure out the OP stuff. Skill issue, I will not change a single thing. Solarian going back to full strength and uh, have fun winning the whole tournament, Three Crows. See you guys later. GG. Yeah, I'll abuse them.